Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host for today, John DeLynn. It is March 16th, 2023, and we are super excited to have back on Mormon Stories uh, kind of a legend and a world leader in uh, understanding uh, cults and in helping people break free. We have with us Dr. Stephen Hassan. Hey, Stephen, welcome to Mormon Story Studios. Thanks, John. It's so great to be here and nice to meet you in person, finally. Yeah, yeah I picked you up at the airport last night, and it's been fun to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, and we went for a latte, and the Starbucks <laughs> woman called you out, and me, too. It's called fun. us out, yeah. That's so we're, I'm getting Steve a latte, and the woman's like, are you John DeLynn? And I was like, embarrassed. Yeah. And then she looked over and she says, wait, are you Stephen Hassan? <laughs> it was really funny. I think there's probably like three people in all of Utah that would be able to identify as both, only because we run in different circles sometimes, but that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, and we snapped some selfies, so that was fun too. So um, uh, it's it's been an honor to bring Stephen Hassan here to Utah. We wanted to have him come for a long, long time. I'm going to just do a quick little intro about a couple things and then uh, we're gonna jump in. Today's episode is gonna be all about Stephen's story. So uh, tomorrow we're gonna have him back to talk about um, his work with cults and with people leaving cults and then with, with people trying to heal and grow from having been in cults or high demand religions. But just to give you a quick uh, couple things about Stephen, um, the book that we brought him on to discuss before, the book that I think if there's one book you read from Stephen, I'm going to recommend it's this one, Combating Cult Mind Control, the number one best-selling guide to protection, rescue, and recovery from destructive cults. Um, Stephen is the founder or the author or the originator of the BITE model, uh, behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions, which is a really uh, valuable way, along with his influence continuum, to evaluate undue influence uh, or uh, unhealthy organizations or relationships. And by the way, uh, his work applies not just to churches and religions, but to governments, to educational institutions, to gurus, to yoga instructors, to um, multi-level marketing scams, to, uh, you know, even podcasters. Like, it's applicable, it's, it's, it's applicable in your marriage, uh, it, with your relationship with your parents. Like, it's all about just coercion and undue influence and learning about how to um, how to deal with it. There's a second book that he, um, he's the author of several books. A, a second book that we're gonna be referencing today and tomorrow is Freedom of Mind, Helping Loved Ones Leave Controlling People, Cults, and Beliefs. Uh, he has a third book called The Cult of Trump, which we're not gonna be covering today and tomorrow, um, just to avoid polarization and getting distracted on Mormon stories. I try and stay away from talking about politics. But um, Steve would tell you it's one of his most important books. So uh, you guys can check that out if you want. We won't be covering that today or tomorrow. Um, but we're also bringing Stephen here to speak to Mormons and post-Mormons along the Wasatch Front. So in the description on both YouTube and Facebook right now, there's several links. Tonight, uh, Stephen's going to be speaking at the Lost and Found Club, um, which is uh, led by Chelsea Homer, dear friend of mine. She has a Facebook group called uh, the Faith Journey Meetups, which is like almost 10,000 post-Mormon women who provide support to each other. Stephen speaking tonight. There's still tickets available for that. If you want to click and see Steve tonight, um, I think it's in Sandy, but check out the Lost and Found Club link for that. Um, Saturday, Stephen speaking at Thrive. Uh, there's two, Thrive, U Thrive Unite is happening like in 20 cities across the world. Stephen's going to be speaking at Lehigh Thrive in the morning in Lehigh, Utah, and then at Ogden Thrive in the afternoon. So those are two opportunities you have to see Steve speak. There are links to Thrive Unite also in the show notes right now in the description. And then finally, Stephen and I are hosting an all-day workshop in Alpine, Utah this Sunday, and there are still tickets available for that if you want to see us do our thing um, for a full day, something we've never done before. So we're really excited about that. And then the last thing, the most important thing, I think, for Steve, other than you buying right now his books, which I encourage you all to do, Stephen has an amazing online course that he's made available. It's like nine hours of amazing content, a foundational course of his thoughts and feelings, kind of like 
40 years how many years worth of, of work have you done in now Colts? 47 john 47 yeah 47 years <clears throat> working in colts he's put together a foundational course for clinicians but also for you and for your friends for coaches for anyone who thinks they could benefit from his 47 years of expertise on colts i highly recommend it in the show notes and descriptions right now there's a link and you can purchase the course and it's a way to support him and his lifelong um, dedication to supporting people uh, escaping from cults and high demand religions and then rebuilding healthy, happy lives. Stephen also works as a coach or as a, he, he has a PhD. He, he um, has done the graduate work in, in mental health, but he works um, helping people uh, transition out of unhealthy cults or organizations, but also dealing with family members with personal assistance, Zoom calls, interventions to help people who are in need, um, whether it's you or, or dear friends or family. So that's my introduction, Steve. He's also been on every single media outlet you can think of, Oprah, Bill O'Reilly, CNN, you know, CS, you know, ABC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. You really can't mention a prominent media outlet probably that Stephen hasn't been on multiple times. So he's a real global um, thought leader. And Stephen, what did I miss or what would you want to add to your intro? Well, I would just say that I got interested in the subject because I was recruited into the Moonies cult in 74. So if we add in my two and a half years in the Moonies, then I'm going to be 49 years of doing this. But really what propelled me and has continued to propel me was that um, it happened to me and I had experienced a radical personality change and uh, cut off from my family and friends and became a right-wing fascist person who was capable of violence if I was ordered to do so. And I was deprogrammed. We'll do that tomorrow. But uh, the rest, the beginning was just trying to figure out what the hell happened to me and, yeah. and researching and some of the top people saying, you really should study psychology and explain it further. So I I owe my family for helping to rescue me out of the Moonies after a near fatal van crash. And February of 2024 will be 50 years, yeah. my 50 year anniversary. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good preview for today because today we're not going to be dealing into the clinical or the procedural or the structural uh, ideas around cults and, and his life body of work. Today, we're just going to do a traditional Mormon story where Stephen tells his story. We're live streaming it because we wanted to promote his upcoming events this weekend. Yep. And uh, Samantha Shelley from Zelf on the Shelf will be joining us in just a bit. We notified her last minute that we wanted her to help co-host. But we're going to we're gonna try and tell your story in kind of a maybe a two to three hour um, engagement. So never been done before. Yeah, so yeah, I'll try to calm my nerves. Yeah. And, and I just want to say that like your story deserves high quality audio and video. Um, and, um, and so that's why I'm really grateful we were able to fly you here and, uh, and spend today doing this. So yeah, no, you. I'm excited and we'll do more tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump in, Stephen. Uh, I, normally I say, how does your Mormon story begin? But you don't necessarily have a Mormon story, do you? Um, nope. So tell us just a tiny bit about your parents, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Sure. And did they have a religious upbringing or a cult upbringing? And then did they raise you with any you know, religious or spiritual foundation? Let's start. There. Okay, so I was born in 1954 in Flushing, Queens, New York. Uh, I have two older sisters, Thea and Stephanie. So I was the youngest of three. My mom um, be, got her master's and became an art teacher in middle school when I, um, I guess, turned 12. So she was like a home homemaker, and then she became a teacher, and an art teacher. My dad had been a musician growing up. He actually played trumpet in the Army during World War II, but went into his father's hardware store business. Uh, when he met my mom, he wanted to have more stability than being a musician, I'm told. So I grew up um, uh, going to Hassan Hardware in Ozone Park, Queens. 
And I was I grew up in a small attached house on 172nd Street and near Union Turnpike. It was just opposite St. John's University. Um, and St. John's is a Catholic college big on basketball. And I grew up with the Knicks and basketball. I'm six feet tall, but I love that sport. So I grew up playing basketball. I was a very introverted kid. I was told by my mom that uh, in the beginning, I they were worried that I had a developmental problem because I, I wasn't doing baby talk. And then when I started talking, I was talking in sentences. And the, then they realized I, I was bright, I guess. Um, and I loved to read. I was a basic introvert. And uh, so I was reading you know, textbook chap, you know, major books, even when I was seven, eight, nine years old. So I was kind of interested in big topics. Um, so do, what else? Do you know, so you, you have Jewish ancestry, ah, right? You, yes. Forgive me. So, and, and even before your parents, like, do you know about your Jewish ancestry prior to your parents? Yes. Good question. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by saying my mom grew up Orthodox Jewish. Orthodox. So my grandparents also were Orthodox. Queens? They were in Bronx. Okay. Um, my dad, um, was much more of a cultural Jew and not as observant. Um, but my mom lit Shabbat candles. We had a kosher household, which means separating milk from meat things and no shellfish, no pork in the house and different dishes for, for milk and meat types of things. I went to temple on, on Shabbat. I was bar mitzvahed. Um, I really didn't like the Judaism I was taught as a child. It didn't make sense to me. But why not? Um, I just couldn't relate to the notion of a divine being that was angry and judgmental and would deliberately harden Pharaoh's heart <laughs> in order to and, or do plagues and kill firstborns. Like, what? Like, that was so bizarro for me. And you, and you, you tuned into that as a, as a kid. Oh, I, I, I was reading philosophy books as a child. So by the time I was bar mitzvah, I was very identified as a Jew. And I should add that I've had a very weird experience because my last name is spelled H-A-S-S-A-N. So many people mispronounce it as Hassan. Uh, and that was the name of the cousin of Muhammad of the uh, Muslim religion. And so I, you know, many Jews thought I was an Arab or they thought I was a Muslim. And so I experienced discrimination. And after 9-11, I had trouble getting on an airplane because of the spelling of my last name. I went to Israel um, to do an archaeological dig in the Negev Desert at Tel Beersheba or Beersheba, which is in the Bible. Um, and they almost, uh, the Israelis wouldn't, um, almost didn't let me on the airplane because they thought I might be an Arab terrorist or something. So it, that's always been interesting to me, but also I've always been a human rights kind of guy and really believe in things like honesty and justice and human rights. Uh, so that was my, my early childhood. I, I, um, so theologically, the belief in God, the belief in Judaism is uh, the Jewish people is like God's chosen people, the belief in like a literal Adam and Eve and, and a literal Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and a global flood. Uh, you know, uh, how did you, how did you, uh, Joan and the whale, how did you square those very traditional Jewish teachings you know, so you're a, asking me child. when I was yeah, five, yeah. ten, yeah. or so. Yeah. Um, I did not believe in a literal Adam and Eve story at all. That didn't make sense because I grew up with science and and evolution, and uh, so that you know they were myths, and 
my my education as a Jew was that we were chosen, but we were chosen to be servants, and we were not better than others. We just had an obligation, a special obligation, to do what's called tikkun olam, which is repair the world. Uh, it's a very important value that I grew up with that I still continue to believe in, that we have an obligation as human beings to not just take care of ourselves, but to take care of others, um, to make the world a little bit better place. Um, Would you have been taught by your rabbis to not take the Torah literally? The, the, the oh, absolutely. Story? Jews do not take the Torah literally. Okay. Period. Well, like that. That's never been the case. Okay. I don't want to. I'll I'll say Jew explain you, but um, do whatever like, you want. Like, it's my in my understanding. There's there's ultra orthodox Judaism, there's conservative Judaism or orthodox Judaism, and I know those are even separate things: conservative versus orthodox. But then there's like Reform Judaism and Reconstructionist Judaism. There's a whole con a spectrum. Yes. And so, wouldn't wouldn't the more conservative um, branches of Judaism take? the bible literally is not a at all document? What? not even the orthodox or the ultra orthodox really? the old religion was like temple sacrifice of animals and when the temple was destroyed judaism transformed to be a rabbinic interpretation religion which means what it means that that the few people mostly guys to my understanding mostly male patriarchal uh, it was an oral tradition where they would memorize Torah. It eventually got written down on, on parchment uh, as the Torah scrolls. But from its um, ever since the temple was destroyed, it's all about rabbinic interpretation of what was in the Torah. And honestly, a lot of things have been mistranslated um especially by christians and others that have nothing to do with judaism they just don't get the core concepts even of judaism well i don't i mean i don't i don't want to belabor this point but like you're telling me like a hasidic rabbi doesn't believe that moses was a historical figure oh no uh, they would believe that moses was a historical or figure a and flood. god spoke at sinai and many different religions they would believe that but they don't look at the torah without rabbinic interpretation okay well, they, they don't just global... read the words in hebrew and and say this is the uh the literal immutable inerrant word of god that can't be changed but there would be a branch of jews somewhere that believed in a literal adam and eve and in a literal global flood. i would Noah. agree that for me so i believe in a continuum and there are ultra orthodox people that would look at me and say i'm not a jew yeah because yeah. i eat shellfish right or because i drive to my temple on shabbat right and for them doing anything that is work, because they take that verse literally. Yeah. Uh, but my rabbi drives to, to temple in order to lead services, and for him, it's work to do a service, to what, do a sermon and everything else. Was your, was your temple growing up considered a reform temple? No, it was considered conservative. Okay. So uh, males were asked to wear yarmulkes or kippahs on their head. All of the time or just when they're in the temple? In temple, okay. in, the, in the sanctuary of the... So the temple had a lot of offices and school um, uh, uh, office uh, space, etc. But in the sanctuary where the, where the Torah resides in the ark, uh, where I grew up, men and and if women wanted to, would wear talit or talises, the prayer shawls and yarmulkes. And typically, when I went as a child, I would dress up with a tie and, you know, mm -hmm. not go in tattered jeans and and uh, right. uh, sandals. So your your beliefs growing up uh, as a Jew were non non literal. You believe you do, you right. trump science trumped 
stories of the Bible. You saw the Bible as kind of fable or myth. They were definitely, and and yeah. the mindset is is that Judaism evolved because it started as a cult of the temple where these high priests would take you know animals and sacrifice them, and uh, the idea was that you could atone for your sins through using the high priest, and there was a whole set of rituals and ornaments and and such, and. Um, I know we're talking about my early childhood, but tomorrow or whatever, we can talk about where I've been out for the last 15, sure. 20 years because it's evolved. Right. Because okay. I pretty much was disillusioned with Judaism. <laughs> uh, by, by the time I went through my bar mitzvah, I was just like, okay, well, I, I'll play on my temple's basketball team. But that was kind of where I was at. So what made you become disillusioned with Judaism? What, what were the main pillars of your disillusionment so you you need to understand my father worked on shabbat it was his big day of the week in the hardware store and i was brought in to work with him because he wanted me not to be an introvert and he wanted me to learn the importance of work and talking to strangers and selling them paint or screws or fixing windows and all of those kinds of things so it was my mom's side of the family where um like lighting the candles and celebrating the fact that there was a, a day that was supposed to be uh not about the worldly work but a day of of family and good food and napping and going going to temple yes but um a day of contemplation and soul restoration and i still love the idea of shabbat and um i think and i do torah study every every saturday morning on but go, but going back to then yeah no back to then my childhood uh so it was interesting because my father's side was very secular and cultural and my mother's side was very religious and i loved my grandfather and he would put on tefillin which is a uh, a prayer uh leather scroll of dedication so he would go in the basement by the our washing machine and daven and do his 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 prayers uh and for him it was really important and my mom was uh would pray for things uh and so there was and i love my mom i was very close with her uh, much more emotionally close than with my dad growing up so given your mom loved it so much what led to your disillusionment what what were the top three to five things you became disillusioned with with ju your jewish upbringing it's a very interesting point no one's asked me this were they um, mean? Were they strict? Did you just not like the doctrine? It wasn't strict. And I had friends who weren't kosher and weren't, you know, they were Jewish culturally, but they weren't observant. Um, and somewhere around, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, we would start eating out at Chinese restaurants and I was exposed to pork and I would eat it and I didn't, nothing bad happened to me and shellfish. I kind of like scallops and shrimp and lobster. Hmm. So it started, you know, culinarily uh, hmm. for me to be uh, not following kosher laws but otherwise, I didn't feel like it resonated with my sense of the divine. That said, I always had a faith in God from my childhood, and I still do. But it's not this notion of a anthropomorphized guy floating in the clouds with a beard, um, you know who's a judge and who hard you know has uh, anger and is going to wipe out the world um that just never made sense to me and it felt more like it was a greek or roman god's kind of orientation uh to me uh than what made sense to me 
And of course, I want to emphasize that I grew up post-Holocaust. And while I didn't lose any family, this was something from my earliest memory that the Nazis rounded up so many people and killed them. And because we were Jewish, even if we didn't believe religiously, so that was an important part of my psyche was that we were a small minority religion and that a lot of people blamed us for a lot of the world problems uh and therefore we should stick together <laughs> you know against you know the 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 masses so to speak so it sounds like theologically the idea of a anthropomorphic god didn't make sense to never you. made sense to me you didn't like kosher the diet the, the dietary it, it wasn't that didn't i didn't sense. like it didn't sense. it didn't it, i didn't feel like guilty if i went so. out and had a white castle hamburger yeah. or you know whatever and did with the holocaust did you just feel like if we're the chosen that's not that's not a it doesn't seem like a great honor to be chosen was, was that part of it just like if we're god chosen people and and humanity keeps punishing us so severely maybe I don't, maybe i'm not super interested in being one of god's chosen so i really want to emphasize that from in my experience and the people that i know growing up the notion of being chosen is not the same as outsider super ject that I'm, we think we're superior and therefore we should run everything right that's not what i meant sorry i just right. meant that that it, there's got to be some irony to to the idea of a chosen people but then to see the severe persecution that jews have experienced for millennia i'm just saying you mentioned the holocaust as i talked to you about disillusionment was the holocaust you know that made me to want to this. identify more as a jew oh okay not less not less so the holocaust didn't really factor into your disillusionment no no okay um i there's a few other things i want to just say about my my memory of my childhood and how i thought of things um so one one of the messages that that i received is your education is they can't take that away from you if the nazis show up they could take your house they could take your art they can take your car but they can't take your mind so that that was something that still is really really important and the other thing i want to emphasize was that one of the most important holidays growing up jewish is the liberation from bondage story from pharaoh and i believe that you know this getting together having matzah it's called passover uh, to remember being a slave, to remember that you know people didn't want to leave the comfort of Egypt, and uh, you know the scary, this whole scary thing. Um, but this notion that people were enslaved but didn't know about it, and we can talk more about this tomorrow if you want. But it's a very important theme, for also I believe. And when I reflect back on my life journey, that this is a liberation from cult mind control story sure. that I grew yeah. up with, and I got into a cult. Okay, and, so so do you? You know, we'll, we'll be talking about the influence continuum, sure. but do you consider your Jewish upbringing as where do you put that on the influence continuum? With, with acknowledging that our audience doesn't even really have an introduction to the influence continuum, but just pretend they did. Where where would you put your upbringing on the influence continuum? So, f because it's a continuum to ethical to unethical, it was much more over to the ethical informed consent. I never felt coerced um to believe or to i had to go to services it was more like a social thing to do with my grandfather when he visited or you know i i typically uh i never went with my dad to services except during my bar mitzvah or something like that was a a, a marking of becoming an adult yeah. you know when you're 13 and you read from the scroll and you give a little devar or a teaching 
uh, and it's like public speaking practice in the Jewish religion. But um, I was always interested in ideas, many different kinds of ideas, right. and I never felt constrained by my family or my culture or my religion that I had to, that I had to be in a box. Yeah. Okay. So what was your mom or your mom's side of the family frustrated when they when she noticed you were kind of distancing yourself from the faith? Was there any family drama about apostasy in Mormon language or zero? Was she, was she even sad to see you becoming secular? I don't think so. I think well, my mom was one of these women who was saintly, uh, if I can use that Christian esque term. Uh, she was just unconditionally loving and creative and kind and believed, you know, the best in people. She was a bit of a worry wart, which is her parents. They worried about everything. So I picked up some of that worry gene, I think, from that side of the family. Mm. Um, but, um, no, they just wanted me to be happy and safe, and they wanted me to, I was bullied a bit in elementary school because I was a bit of a nerd, I guess, to use that language. Um, but I was good at school, so uh, yeah. some people may have felt intimidated or, you know, jealous or whatever. But, you know, things came easily to me in school. In fact, I was pretty bored in school, so I was always, like, reading books. Right. Overall, then, do you feel like Judaism provided you with the valuable structure to grow up? And when I say Absolutely. that, like identity, community, morality, spirituality, was yes. it a good container for you to develop within? Yes. In your view? Okay. Yeah, I really do. I, I, uh, when I did, when I talk about my life experience to other people, uh, and the only other person who asked me about Judaism was Joe Rogan. I know I'm jumping out of frame to the 2015, but when he heard I was a Jew, he t asked me questions for 30 minutes because he had knew nothing about Judaism. And he was shocked that a cult expert who knew, you know, was into Judaism. But um, so anyway, I, I want to stay faithful to your desire yeah, to keep good. me in my childhood. Okay. But my recollections were really, I was into, you know, TV was happening. We had a black and white TV and I spent a lot of time watching all kinds of Leave really, Leave yes. Leave and and, and uh, yeah, but I also was into combat and some of the post-World War II war things. In fact, I talk about my my child parts that I had grown out of that got recruited to become a Mooney, but that we can talk about tomorrow. No, we're talking about the Mooney stuff today. Oh, we are. Um, okay. okay. So, okay. But, so, but I, I was, I was, um, not to, to sound extreme, but I was reading philosophy, like postgraduate philosophy books when yeah. I was seven, eight, nine years no, of that. age. That, so, yeah. I was just thinking in a way like, why isn't the world better? Yeah. Like, why are things so screwed up? This right. is not the way it should be. Why is there racism? Why is there yeah. injustice? So how do you go from what I, sounds like a really idyllic Jewish upbringing into a cult? Take us through, like, it would seem like you you were given a good upbringing. You loved science. You loved to learn. And uh, you were curious and had a great upbringing. Take us to the path that leads you to join a cult. Well, so um, what made you vulnerable and or interested? So nobody joins a cult knowing what it is. I need to state that categorically. So um, for me, I was. Uh, I was in the last draft lottery to go to Vietnam. I I grew up, you know, being very like we have to fight evil and we fought Hitler in World War II. 
And then, of course, the communism threat we would get under our wooden desks because Russia might nuke us at any moment. So that kind of mentality. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Martin Luther King was assassinated. We were in the Vietnam War. This didn't make a lot of sense that we were not doing anything but harming a lot of civilians and spending a lot of money. And that made no sense, et cetera. Um, and, and I discovered I liked to write poetry. So I found my voice, I think it was in third grade. I had a teacher who, who encouraged me to write and to do art. And so that's kind of, Steve was, and it's, it's an art form where it's kind of free form, um, trance writing, <laughs> you know, like words that come to you and you put them down and then you reshape them to communicate a feeling or a thought or an idea or a series of things. So I, that's kind of where I was at. I had skipped eighth grade because in New York City, you had, could if you scored high on the tests. So I was 17 when I graduated high school. And what year was that? I want to say 71. Okay. My father said, you know, being the male child, both my sisters got married very young in their lives. Uh, so, uh, and my mom was an art teacher. My father said, do you want to take the business over? It's a good business. It's, you know, you can make a great living. It's very secure. And I'm like, dad, I can't see myself selling, you know, being in a hardware business, threading pipe and pumping kerosene into uh, to alcohol bottles, which I did in the back. Um, and so he said, I have, you know, high blood pressure, varicose veins, and, my, you know, your sisters have left the house. I think I'm going to sell the business. And I was like, great. He said, well, then you have to go to college or get a job. Like, th those are your options. And in retrospect, that was an error if I could go back in time and tell my parents there was no such thing as a gap year back then, I would have said, don't rush them into college. And I'll also say that I had, in retrospect, a very insulated uh, experience growing up because all my friends, all of my cultural interactions were with uh, fellow Jews, and I knew nothing about Christianity or any other world religion. And it wasn't until I was in college that I got to start talking with people and learning about all these other religions. And I wish that I had been taught in my Hebrew school, as my son later was, here's what Christians teach, and here's what Muslims teach, and here's what Buddhism teaches, to just like say, hey, there's a lot of different paths to being spiritual. So there was some ignorance about that 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 played into it but the truth of the matter is i was not a joiner like i think i was in my sixth grade chorus and i was on a basketball team i wasn't good enough to be on my high school team because i was only six feet tall we had a six foot 11 center we were citywide champions but i scored rebounds and i helped in the practices <laughs> that was as good as i could get in terms of basketball anyway i lost my train of thought so, uh, so say? let's try and really narrow in so Please. i'm assuming you're in college what what was it about your state that made you vulnerable to oh, a cold? Were right. you were you, let me just give you a couple options. Were you depressed? Were you lonely? Did you not have a sense of meaning and purpose? What primed you to be open to? No, I was a creative thing? writing major, and and I was working as a banquet waiter at the Holiday Inn in Hempstead on the weekends to make money. I should also add, when I turned 17, I had a thing with my father where I said, because I was earning money in the hardware store, I said, I'm going to buy a motorcycle. And my father said, they're too dangerous. And I said, I can't afford a car. And he said, so if I get you a car, will you promise not to get a motorcycle? And I said, sure. And I came home one day and he handed me keys to a, a gold Dodge Dart swinger with a vinyl roof and i was 17 and i just love cars and driving and but the the point is is that i um 
to answer your question, I loved women. I, I started dating, like for me, I was a young kid, but my hormones were normal and uh, I fell in love with a woman at 17 and she broke my heart and I wrote a whole bunch of poems about that. And, and, and so what made me vulnerable? I had another uh, girlfriend, a model, who dumped me very abruptly and rudely and uh so i was kind of down about you know this really sucks i really cared about her and you know is this what love is and it really sucks and uh i was just beginning the spring semester it was february of 1974 and three women at the college cafeteria uh, asked if they could join me at my table because uh, I was waiting for my next class. I had just gotten my textbooks for college. And I said, sure. And they started flirting with me, what later is called love bombing. We also call it flirt to convert. Yeah, well, I learned how to do that as a good Mooney. So mm. I was not looking to join anything. And um, you had I, your heart broken and you were kind of like, I had my heart broken. And these three really attractive women just like zoomed in on me. Uh, those books are really, I think I had Heidegger's Being in Time. I think I had a book on the Upanishads. I had a philosophy of religion class, I believe. And um, they just flirted with me. And I said, are you students? Yes, we are. You know, are you part of some religious group? No, we're not. Uh, well, so what, what are you up to? Well, we part of the student movement trying to make the world a better place. Maybe you'd like to come visit some of our friends tonight for a free dinner. And I knew nothing about cults. And I should also add, I forgot to mention this, but I bicycled across the U.S. when I was 16. Um, I, uh, I worked in the Negev Desert at 17. I drove across Canada to Alaska when I was 18 with my buddy Lenny uh, all the way up the Alcan Highway to Alaska. And I was this punk 19 year old who thought I knew it all. And you know, like, no one could mess with my mind. You know, it didn't even enter my consciousness that there was any danger at all. And my father made a big mistake when I was in the hardware store. He said, Steve, you can always know when people are lying by checking out their eyes. Hmm. When they're lying, their eyes are going to like be shifty. Hmm. These women looked me dead in the eyes and lied their faces off, as wow. I learned to do later as a good Mooney. Let me just test Samantha. Let's make sure your mic's working really quick. Hello. Are we hearing me? It looks like it's working, yeah. <clears throat> the audience, please text if uh, you can't hear Samantha. Mm. Okay. So you had your heart broken, and then three cute young girls, what was their pitch? These were they were no, movies. it was it was like you're fascinating, you're so smart, you're so good looking, you're you know, like just all the love bombing kinds of things. And I was very vulnerable because I was I was down and I was like, What what's going on? This really sucks. So what happened next? So they they basically said, are you doing anything tonight? No. Would you like to come over and have dinner and meet some of our friends from all over the world? Sure. Here's the address. And I didn't understand what this group was. No one had heard of the Moonies by then, by the way, in February of 74. I should also add it was the same month Patty Hearst was abducted by the Symbionese Liberation Army, just for those people thinking historical contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically I, I arrived at this house. There were about 30 people there. There were people from Holland, <coughs> Germany, uh, uh, the UK, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, and probably a few other European countries. And we sat on the, on a wooden floor as food was served and then later in the evening, oh, our friend from Holland is giving a talk. Would you like to listen? Again, I had no antenna up that this is a cult and they're trying to recruit me. It was like, would you like to meet our friend? So sure, I'm generally open-minded and want to learn. And 
experience different people. Um, so I listened to this lecture and it was weird because people in the room were like falling asleep as the guy was talking and I'm sitting there and people, and some people are like hitting themselves <laughs> and that was really weird. And I don't have a lot of memory of the content of that talk. My biggest memory was people falling asleep. And then afterward, when the lecturer asked me what I thought, I said, like, what's up with the people who are like falling asleep? And, oh, you wouldn't understand. Which, of course, makes you more curious <laughs> if somebody says something like that. Well, try, well this teaching is really powerful and uh, there are forces that don't want people to know Whoa, this that material that? that's what he said to me the people are falling asleep because of evil unseen forces. didn't use the word evil but uh, yeah spiritual forces Dang. that was the first word of spiritual but again the frame was we're not part of a religious group they were very congruently lying to me that Wait, we're they told you flat out they're not a religious correct. group. correct and I don't know why I even asked the question, but obviously it was in my mind. Mm. I have a very clear memory of asking them, oh, no, not at all. And I was looking at their eyes. Are they lying? And it's like, nope, they're they're on the level. Um, so how did your indoctrination happen? It was a whole series of things that happened. Um, like just kind of like a step by step. But I need to thing. explain to you that I worked as a banquet waiter on the weekends at the Holiday Inn. And so sometimes it was a wedding. Sometimes it was some other function. Each weekend was a different time to report. Sometimes it was a Friday night or a Saturday or a Sunday. And they started talking about, we're all going away this on the weekend. You have to join us. And I was like, I work. Sorry. And they're like, oh, but you're going to miss out. And it's like, too bad. That's, you know, I've worked every, every weekend for two years. And that's, I need to make my money, get my gas money and whatever. Um, and they just kept repeating it. And I said, listen, I work. If sometime I don't have to work then I'll come. That was a mistake that I said that because two days later, I called my boss up. What time do you need me? Oh, the wedding was canceled. Take the weekend off. Never happened before. So I'm like, wait a minute. I wasn't that um, suspicious or whatever but i was like i don't know this is really weird a synchronicity or something and maybe i'm meant to go to this weekend together so and i had given my word if i don't have to work and i'm a person of my word and they're cute young women they were cute yeah. but but so Yes, and I didn't have anything to do that weekend. And I drove to the house and I got into their van and it went to a location I didn't know. This is way before cell phones, so nobody knew where I was going. I didn't know where I was going. And as we're driving into this multi-million dollar estate in Tarrytown, uh, at the front of the van, they say, oh, by the way, this weekend we're having a joint workshop with the Unification Church. Hmm. And I went, church? This isn't religious. Workshop? Nobody said anything about a workshop. I want to go back. Oh, what's wrong, Steve? Are you scared or something? Well, I'm not scared, but I want to go back. Like, I didn't want to be part of a workshop or do something with church. I'm Jewish. I'm not interested. And they're like, do you have a thing against Christians? So they did a typical mind controller, turn it around on you. <laughs> that is your problem versus, no, they lied to me, the women who recruited me. And I said, I want to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not going back, you know, now, but we'll go in the morning. We'll drive you back in the morning. Why don't you come in and, and uh, you know, we'll get you in the morning. So then I go in. There's a fireplace. People are singing uh, uh, 
folk songs, things that I grew up. I, I didn't mention I went to sleepaway camp during the summers when I was a child. So I had some individuation and got to be in the woods and learn how to canoe and swim and all these other things in, in summer camp. But it reminded me of summer camp, like, you know, get around, sing, you know, 500 miles and, you know, this land is your land, <laughs> other Peter, Paul and Mary types of songs. And the people seemed very nice, but I just, I wanted to leave and I didn't have a way to leave. In retrospect, I would have like went out and hitchhiked in the snow <laughs> in a dark road. Get me out of here. But I didn't realize I was, I was in danger. So the morning comes, I didn't sleep well because there was a lot of noise. It was a group male dormitory type situation with sleeping bags, etc. And I come down, okay, I'm ready to go. Oh, the van left. So sorry. Hmm. But why don't you just go have breakfast and you know, I'll see what, what we can do. And it was just like this one thing after another that was just delaying, delaying, delaying. And I wound up staying for two days. The end of the second night, I'm like, okay, I have class in the morning. Let's go back to Queens. And they're like, oh, no, there's a third day. You don't want to miss the third day, do you? And I'm like, I have class in the morning. I want to go back. Like, drive me. And... um so they worked on me for, I don't know, an hour or two, persuaded me that I would regret it for the rest of my life if I didn't hear the conclusion of the workshop. So I stayed a, a third day, missed a day of class. What was the general substance of the workshops? So the Mooney's ideology is called the divine principle. I later became a lecturer and recruiter for this. So I know the theology quite well. Um, and the workshop lectures were, it was very organized. I would say there were three believers to one newcomer, but you didn't know that. Oh. You didn't know that you were. Confederates, basically. Oh, absolutely. Creating the appearance of. Correct. And yeah, then there were yeah. groups of sheeps and goats. They wanted the, the good people they wanted to really hone in on. And each had a team leader. And then there was a spy person and they would meet in the evenings. I didn't know this at the time, but I, like I said, I became a leader and I understood the, the, the methodology. Um, and so there would be discussions on like what's going on. Oh, and they would ask everyone to write a reflection sheet after each evening. So there would be this, these discussions on how are we going to get to Steve or how we're going to get to Mary or whatever. And they would orchestrate conversations in between the lectures and the workshops and the fun sports activities that were worked into the day. You were never left alone. Even if you had to go to the bathroom, someone spontaneously needed to pee also at the same moment. But I didn't realize this all at the same time uh, at that moment. In any case... So the theology... or what, The theology the was like... If there is a God, then God's creation would be perfect, but it's not. So, like, what happened? What went wrong? And there was a whole theology about God as masculine and feminine and give and take action and what was called the four position foundation. There was a lot of gobbledygook in, in retrospect, but it was presented with such seriousness as if this is the ideology that will explain everything in fact later they would call it the completed testament the old testament the new testament and the completed testament why because all of human history was to serve the coming of the messiah on earth to complete the original garden of eden um uh, goal that god wanted to create the perfect expression of his love so it was rooted in the holy bible oh yeah <clears throat> Um, and there was so, a lot that was cherry picked. I mean, after I got out, I did a deep dive to understand 
theology, talking with Jewish theologians, Christian theologians, etc. But I didn't, I didn't have any exposure to Christianity, so I really didn't know. And any talk of Jesus didn't work for me. Like I didn't have a, a big negative, but it was like not my worldview <laughs> that I was operating from. But the idea, the Jew, Jews do have an idea of a Moshiach or the Messiah, but the Jewish presentation of that person is a person who brings peace, not someone who is God in human form or anything else but like there will, there will be a good ending god will send a good person that will bring an ending so the the idea that was put to me was um and I'll, I'll i'll give you a quick demo of the final uh minutes of a three-day workshop of the moonies if you'd like i can yeah. go into that so the lecturer would and I should say the whole workshop was up and down emotional states and a lot of hypnotic stuff where they were asking people to visualize an ideal world or visualize all the starving children on earth, et cetera. Um, and um, the, the feedback sheet for me, the end of the third day was, I am too blown away to write anything now. <laughs> as much as because what i again in 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 analyzing after the fact i was overloaded emotionally psychologically i i i, I didn't know what was up or what was down but the the rap was something like this and the guy would be pacing back and forth so you hear you've been hearing a lot of very deep profound things in the last three days. And maybe, just maybe, it's a pile of rubbish. But on the other hand, what if? What if? What? If it's true, could you just walk away? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Father, we are your children, Father. Please open up our hearts, Father. The world is suffering. And for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, and then people would be broken up into small groups to pressure them to stay for the seven-day workshop that starts the next morning. And I had already made up my mind, I'm leaving. <laughs> like, whatever they say or do, I'm out of here. This is too much. I thought I was going to have a fun weekend. What the hell's going on here? And I went home. My, my mother said, where have you been? We've been so worried about you. I don't know. I was in upstate New York at this multi-million dollar mansion. She said, you look like you're on drugs. Were you doing drugs? And I was like, I don't think they gave me any drugs. And my mother said, let's go talk to the rabbi. Let's go talk to the rabbi. I said, sure. So we went to my temple. We talked to the rabbi. The rabbi had no clue about cults whatsoever. He thought I was interested in becoming a Christian. My question was, is there going to be a messiah that's coming cuz part of the push is that you know the, we're coming to the end of the world history and we're going to be say, you know the world is going to be divided and god's going to restore his perfect creation and you don't want to miss it like if you go back to college and write poetry and the messiah's on the earth and this monumental war with against communism and satan is going to happen i didn't believe in satan growing up i should be very clear about that jews don't believe in satan or demons or evil spirit or heaven or hell either honestly because i forgot to mention all of that but i just want to know is is it possible that there's a messiah coming and how would we know and he 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 was useless what he should have said to me is steve 
I've never heard of this group, but I can assure you if it's legitimate, it will stand up to scrutiny. Promise me you won't go back or interact with them for the next few weeks. And let's try to find out who they are, what they believe and what's about what's about them. Like, that's what he should have said. I would have been very happy with that answer, and I would have been very cooperative. But I was back at home, back in school, going, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then I had what I thought was a spiritual experience. I was sitting in my bedroom. I had a whole group of books on the floor. Some of them were open. One of them was a book about Ospensky and Gurdjieff which I didn't mention before, but I, again, I was reading all kinds of philosophy books and my next door neighbor was in what turned out to be a cult called the Gurdjieff Foundation. So as I was growing up, he was brilliant. He, he you know, he's a very warm and loving man, uh, was talking about how people are walking around to sleep and how we can work on our consciousness to elevate ourselves, to become, you know, better human beings. So I had read all these books and I, I just grabbed a book. It was by Ospensky in search of the miraculous. And I just, the, the paragraph that my eyes, uh, focused on said something about, how Gurdjieff was uh, a pivotal person in human history because he was alive on earth. And I'm reading this going, but he's dead. And maybe maybe the Messiah is coming. They didn't say it was Sun Myung Moon, by the way. This was like weeks later before they revealed that. Um, and... Uh, so again, I had this experience and I was like, is, am I supposed to learn more about this group? And the appeal wasn't to devote my life. My, the appeal was to find out more, just expose yourself some more. So I looked at that. I thought maybe I need to go back this weekend and listen again. And cause it seemed like, it seemed like the first weekend, it seemed very childish and simplistic to me what I was being, I was very resistant to it, but they kind of broke me down over the days, but now I'm volunteering to go back a second time. And at that point they, I, I did the deep dive into believing that maybe, maybe I'm at this, this chosen person at this major moment in human history, and I'm supposed to help save the world and make the world a better place. And, and you said there was a spiritual experience. That that's what it felt like. I would, I didn't label it a spiritual experience. If anything, it was more like, you know, this, maybe there's something bigger going on here and I'm meant to go. And that was sitting in your room or where were you? I was in sitting in my bedroom and I picked up this book, but it, it had nothing to do with moon. It had nothing to do with, but it had to do with another cult, right. which I didn't realize was a cult. Right. But what I'm trying to convey is that I should never have gotten into this group. If that wedding was never canceled, I never yeah. would have gone. I'm sure I never would have gone. Lack of informed consent. And 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 I got home. I said no to the seven-day workshop, and they worked on me for hours trying to persuade me. And I just and you need to get angry and assertive if you, if unless because if you cave, then you'll you'll do whatever they tell you to do. Because I know that because I became a leader and I used to do this on people to recruit them. But um, but I became a true believer and a model true believer to the point where I was held up as the future of the group. So it sounds like the ingredients were you're in your exploratory years as a young adult, you got dumped, you were probably longing for community and friends. You I had friends. I had community. For girls. I <laughs> wanted to have a girlfriend and okay. I liked sex a lot. So you were looking for a girl, but then they made you feel special and they gave you a sense of purpose and identity along with community and that was a hook right? I'm, I'm resistant to your description and i'll tell you why if i can 
Um, and that is because what I've learned about the mind and about social influence is that the public tends to blame the victim as if they were weak and that's why they got in or vulnerable and that's why they got in. And I, I think human beings are being human, uh, going to be open to influence of all types and some good, some bad, etc. And I honestly wasn't looking to leave my family, drop out of college, throw my poetry out, become a right-wing fascist to murder people without a hesitation if I was ordered to do so. Um, and uh, But I had friends. I had great family. I, had, I lived in this same house. My parents were there for 55 years. Like I knew all the neighbors. They knew us. It was a very tight knit feeling community. So it was, and I was living at home while I was going to Queens College and working on the weekends. So it doesn't really fit in my experience. But again, as I've learned more about social influence and hypnosis, what I was doing before was a hypnotic voice, you know, the deep voice where you're using the pacing. And I'm not going to do more of that. But people go into an altered state when somebody's talking like that for any amount of time. And the only option is to get up and walk out or get up and start walking back and forth and keep meta commenting on what the person in the front is talking about. So you want to resist the suggestion that you were vulnerable in any way. You I was to, vulnerable. You... I was horny. I was I was down. I really thought I would get lucky with one of the three women, honestly. But also, the, they were telling you there's a purpose. There's a there mission, was a bait and, and switch. It was. It, I was not interested in joining a group. I was not interested in joining or changing a but religion. They did tell you there's some big purpose that you're meant for, and you could come be an important Absolutely. part of it. Absolutely. And that it made you feel like you were part of something big, special. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it was my Japanese leader who played a central role in my recruitment and indoctrination. And he played a role unlike my father. And this is a, you know, again, I've done a lot of therapy on myself with good therapists over the years. My father was very stoic and unemotional he almost never hugged me or his father had been an alcoholic he died when i was very young i never knew my grandfather but my my grandfather apparently had an alcoholism problem and would throw things at my father and things and my father's idea of a good father was a father who doesn't drink and doesn't hit his kids mm -hmm. but he rarely would be Steve, I'm so proud of you. You're so smart. In fact, my father never went to college. He was very bright, but he, I felt always, like I remember asking him to help me with a third grade mathematics thing, and he was intimidated because he didn't know, I don't know what it was, if it was geometry or something like that. And it seemed so simple to me, but for him, he was intimidated. So what I'm trying to get at is my father, I'll give you a story that later got resolved in therapy, but I I did a, I think it was a, so, a history regents you know, in New York. There was like a statewide test for competency or whatever. I think it was American history. And I got a 97 out of 100. And one other person got a 97. And almost the whole state flunked that test. And uh, and half of the test was essays. So it wasn't like multiple choice guesswork. And I was so happy I got a 97. I said, Dad, I got a 97. And he said, so what happened to the three points? Hmm. And the guy in the Moonies who became my surrogate father figure was always like, you're special. You have no idea what God has in mind for you. You have a major role to play in 
the history of humankind. And in the Moonies, the ideology is you have 10 generations of your ancestors in the spirit world on your mother's and father's side, and they're all stuck in low levels, and you need to do good acts to give them good spiritual vitality elements to help elevate them. So there's this huge feeling of pressure and guilt to be a good Mooney because all of these beings will accuse you for eternity if you ever betray God and leave and all of that crap. So, and I, I guess I'm the kind of person that if I'm going to do something, I want to do it to the best of my ability. And I, and I can honestly tell you when I was in, <laughs> in college and I had to stand up and read a poem to a class of 20 others, I was shy and I was embarrassed the Moonies would stick me on a stage in front of hundreds of people or a thousand people. And I was speaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I liked the feeling of speaking. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I can credit my cult membership that they taught me about how to run a business and how to public speak and yeah. how to go on three hours of sleep a night for seven days a week. Yeah. And so, Steve, um, we're about an hour and 10 in, so I want to give you a chance to take that break. I like do need take. a break. And so Thank what I'm going to do is bring, go ahead, and I'm going to bring Samantha on. Samantha, as, um, you know, as as we bring Steve here to Utah to talk about cults and his experience with cults, it's, um, it's a little bit problematic because, number one, Mormons <laughs> hate being referred to as a cult. And you could even say, that when you hear a story about like the Moonies, like Steve's experience, or, you know, we mentioned Jim Jones or we mentioned Nexium or, you know, the Symbiese liberation movement or Charles Manson, like, especially when we're talking seventies cults, like I can see why there's a, there's a line of thought, which is like, don't ever call the Mormon church a cult because what Steve just experienced with vans taking you to a place where you're basically kidnapped for multiple days and like coerced and pressured in really intense ways. It's like, that's not that Mormonism isn't even in that game. So it's wrong to use the same word cult to describe the Moonies that you would describe Mormonism. I'm just curious if you have, I've been watching you reflect on similarities in your upbringing. Yeah. And while we're giving Steve a quick break, I'm wondering what, what thoughts you have. Yeah. I'm definitely relating to a lot of uh, what he's saying as he's speaking. And obviously undue influence is a spectrum and you know there are cults where you'd be kidnapped in the van without even choosing to get into the van at all and you're blindfolded you know there's things that are even worse than that i'm sure so it's a whole spectrum but um yeah i'm relating to so much of what are some of the main parts you relate to um d being a, a high achiever academically um being a poet <laughs> even though i wasn't very good at poetry but you know i think poetry is generally associated with um, being maybe sensitive or having a lot of feelings or, you know, um, just the, uh, the interest in philosophy I relate to. Um, also the, you know, Stephen wasn't looking to join a group. He became sort of just curious about this group, which is how it was for me with Mormonism. I thought I was just signing up for, like, I thought the missionary lessons were sort of just like a little class where it's like, let's teach people about our religion because nobody really knows about Mormons in England. So that's what I thought I was signing up for. Um, and it's kind of tricky to talk about because it it was, um, you know, a friend and their family who brought me in. So it wasn't, you know, these uh, strangers plotting to bring, you know, it's these sincere people who really, um, as I'm sure the Moonies uh, sincerely believed in what they were doing. Um, but I, I relate to even little parts of the story, like how Stephen didn't want to really go to this weekend. I remember there was this one time I didn't want to go to another missionary lesson because I was starting to get a sense that it was a bit weird. Um, and so I was trying to get out of it and saying to my friend, oh, well, I have to go to the gym tonight. And I remember him saying, come on, Sam, you know, this is so much more important than the gym. And I, I, and I didn't, but but him saying that did sort of plant something there. And just that kind of uh, what if um, presenting that to the brain is quite powerful. I mean, even in um, like I do intentional living coaching and, and the phrase what if is powerful for the brain, you know, as sort of introducing new ways of being and thinking and yeah.
Mm. So relating to a lot, even down to the alcoholic grandfather and unemotional father, there was a lot. Mm. So, so as, I mean, as hesitant or as eager as some of us may be to either attach or not attach the word cult with Mormonism, if you had to, if you had to sort of so far assess I how familiar his story feels to you, like A to, a to F, what would you yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, it's different by a flavor or a couple of degrees, but it's really not that different. It's really? I am relating a lot. Yeah, and I definitely consider Mormonism a cult having been converted to it, Yeah, especially at 17, similar sort of age. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm really glad you're here, Samantha. Yeah. Yeah. This is very interesting. Yeah. Well, Steve, this is great. So I, I'm going to ask you to do something that maybe you're not prepared to do, but I'm going to give, give it a try. Okay. Let's just say you had one minute or a minute and a half in an elevator, and you had to describe the most important Mooney beliefs, like the elevator pitch of the Mormons call it the plan of salvation. It's like, here it is. You were spirits in before heaven. God sent us to earth to get a body so that you could have experiences on earth. But we all sin, so God sent Jesus to okay, atone for I get our it. sins. I don't know if I can do it in a minute. Can I do two? Yeah, two minutes. <laughs> so uh, Almighty God is perfect and wanted to create the perfect expression of his love. He created Adam and Eve. Uh, before they reached maturity, Lucifer had sexual hard-on for Eve and had sex with her, and she had sex with Adam bringing in a fall of man, all this satanic, evil blood lineage, all of human history is to restore that ideal world. Jesus failed his mission. What? Totally. Fa what? Well, I can't say totally. He half failed his mission because John the Baptist was supposed to become his disciple. The Jews were supposed to march on Rome and take over Rome. And John the Baptist failed. And Jesus, oh, Jesus was uh, the result of a woman and a man, not uh, virgin birth. Uh, and um, and Jesus lost faith on the cross even, but he offered spiritual salvation. He uh, uh, asked Moon. Uh, so history was trying to purify blood lineage from Israel to Korea. And the new Messiah is Sun Myung Moon, who was asked by Jesus to complete his failed mission to restore the world to God. And we're supposed to all speak Korean. All religions will be abolished. And democracy is satanic. And it should be a hegemonic, nepotistic system. And the thing that made the Mooney so famous were the mass weddings where Moon would line up thousands of male fem and female devotees and say, you and you, you and you, you and because he supposedly could read everything about your spirit and know everything because he was the perfect sinless Adam. And, uh, and you were supposed to have five minutes to decide whether you want to do what God wants for you. And of course, everybody, almost everybody said yes to the match. Then you were split and you had to hit each other with a wooden stick on the butt as hard as possible, male what? hitting the female on the butt to root out and pay indemnity for the sin of Adam and Eve having, you know, illicit sex then people would be separated. But the point is, these people didn't know each other. They didn't consent. Many didn't speak the same languages. And they were often sent off on missions where they didn't even see each other for years. And um, and what else? They want to take over the world. They think all other, all, all, everything other than them is evil and needs to be restored. And the Moonies are still very active to this day. Wow. So really quickly, the Bible says explicitly that Mary was a virgin. Like, what did they, how did they get around parts of that theology and doctrine that you just told me when it contradicts with the actual phraseology of the Bible? So now we're getting into theology and that it's not my strength, but I can tell you that um, much of the New Testament was mistranslations of the Hebrew scriptures. 
Uh, no, according to scholars, okay. uh, and the word for maiden is not the same as virg a virgin. Okay, so they would have said a virgin is a mistranslation. Yeah, and the, the one of the big appeals of the Moonies is they were going to unite science and religion. They actually had Nobel scientists, and they would spend millions of dollars doing this conference for the uni un unity of the sciences and religions. And... Uh, they would quote Einstein, they would quote other famous uh, uh, people to portray that we really are grounded in reality. It's not just poofy, you know, religious beliefs, but we, we're about restoring, you know, true love. But coming back to the mass weddings, you have to understand, Moon was married many times before the current woman who's running the group now and and uh, had a child out of wedlock and all kinds of other affairs even though members were not allowed to masturbate or ever have sex without permission with their their assigned partner so there was there's a whole dark side of the actual cult so let, let's that was beautiful you knocked it out of the park oh. great job thank you i don't know if other former moonies would have say but you forgot well, they're not on Mormon the histories story. of the parallel, <laughs> the parallels of history of restoration. That's a good one. So they 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 try to they have a timeline where they try to predict that the Messiah is born between 1917 and 1930, and Moon was conveniently born in 1920. But <laughs> and as a lecturer, as was done when I was being recruited and indoctrinated. Uh, the lecturer would say, and you can go to the library and you can open up the history textbooks and you can check this out, that this is true. Mm. And I would repeat that same BS. Mm. Only when I checked it out, the timelines were wrong. Oh, yeah. Like not even close. So, so. A big plus, lie, big lie. Yeah. A plus on describing an introduction to Mooney, the doctrine of theology. Will you now back up and tell us the history of Sun Young Moon and what we know about his life before he started this church and just a little bit about he's he's passed away now 2012 yeah so um I want to invite people to come to freedomofmind.com. I have lots of documents, including a former government subcommittee investigation on Korean CIA activities in the United States on the Moonies. Um, and again, you need to understand that I was told certain things in the cult as a leader, and I had maybe a hundred leadership meetings where I was in the room with Moon, where I was bowing to the floor before him there was one point where he was redoing the leadership and ordering all the american leaders to 120 day training and he 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 basically said i graduated the 120 day training cuz my leader kamiyama said i was too important we're, we're so, going to get there but huh? just go to his history real quick so he uh was raised presbyterian in in north korea uh, of course, the Korean War happened. He was in a concentration camp, I am told, by the communists, which is probably where he learned a lot about how to do mind control and brainwashing. But what I what I know of him really, uh, I'm, I guess I'm I'm. Uh, no one's asked me this question in a long, long time. But what I want to say is that his group, he was in a cult where he took a lot of the doctrine from. And I have a video with a Japanese uh, Christian uh, friend of mine and colleague who helps get people out of cults like the Moonies, who actually went to Korea and has... I have a video of him showing pictures of the actual history and, uh, of of his past. But it was a small, know-nothing cult until uh, the founder of the Korean CIA decided that th there would be a good proxy group for them to use to brainwash South Koreans who were dissidents to counter North Korean brainwashing. So you're saying the the foundings of of the Moonies of the Unification Church 
was a partnership between Sun Young Moon and the South Korean government? So he started the cult. He was an ex cult member of this other cult that yeah. had, that he stole a lot of the doctrines from. But it was really the Moonies would never become a thing without very intentional political intelligence, intentions, and money. So he started the church in Korea? He started it in Korea, and I don't think it was taken over or guided by the Korean CIA till 61 or 2 or 3, early 60s. So he, he founded it in 54, presumably. Okay. And so he starts it, and then... It, it he had grows. a lot of sex with a lot of student a lot of girls there was there were newspaper articles at the time alleging that he was not a not a, a good uh christian at all did he did he claim special powers from the start did he claim i don't be, know i know, think so you don't know I, I mean i think he did but i don't know that he was telling people overtly that he was the messiah and jesus was he just like a pastor he didn't have any theology training. I think he did a year as an electrical engineer at Waseda University in Japan. So how is he a religious leader if he wasn't a pastor? Was he like a guru? There's a lot of cult leaders who just create a story about their past. And his story is when he was 16, Jesus appeared to him okay, and that. said that he had to fulfill his unfinished mission. So he claimed to be visited by Jesus at age 16? Does Correct. that sound familiar, Samantha? <laughs> Did he claim that at 16 or retroactively? Retroactively. Yeah. I don't know. Again, there are people who have uh, are, are now deceased, but who were there at the beginning, who've written about it. But most of that material is still in Korean or Japanese and not translated. So after he gains a religious following, he claims that previously Jesus visited him and said what? I need you to fulfill my unfinished mission. You are the Lord of the Second Advent. And not only Jesus, but Buddha, Muhammad, everybody, former presidents of the U.S. are all like, you know, bowing before moon is what members believe. And he had a problematic sexual history. At oh, yeah. Age. He left his, you know, his wife and he was partying with lots of uh, college students, apparently. And... Um, the hypocrisy of cult leaders is legendary, uh, I might add, having studied the whole subject. But um, so I, I want to just mention, forgive me, but I'm going to go to 1976. When I got out of the Moonies, I was a very high-ranking person with access to all these internal documents. And I was approached by this congressional subcommittee looking into the Korean CIA. And I said, I will tell you anything you want to know, but I'm afraid they're going to murder me. So can we, you know, not make it public that I am giving you all my documents and that I'm answering all your questions? They said, sure. And it was only after Jonestown happens, because I naively thought the government was going to expose this cult and shut them down because they were involved with so many illegal, improper things, so many that I knew of. Um, then after Jonestown and Leo Ryan was assassinated, 900 people were murdered at the hands of Jim Jones. Uh, I was called to Washington to testify. Senator Dole asked me to come and testify. I get down to DC and the Moonies are protesting and I'm taken off the agenda along with a former people's temple member. And I went, what the hell's going on here? The Moonies were put up to speak at a counter cult thing. And that's when I decided I would read the entire investigation. There were 11 volumes of transcripts of this investigation. That's where I read the, the founder of the Korean CIA, who was under oath, saying, I organized and utilized the Unification Church for use as a political tool. Sure. And it opened up my eyes to a political reality of how psychology has been undergoing a evolution or revolution to 
speedily figure out how to manipulate and brainwash people in mass. Yeah. Well, that, you know, I, I had my first really, uh, I opening shocking moment, just as you tell your story, because Joseph Smith, somewhere between 14 and 16 claims later, 10, 15 years later, that at that same age, he was visited by God and Jesus and he had a problematic sexual history. So for me, and I'm sure for you, Samantha, big bells went off, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they all do that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's common, right? Yeah. It's common enough to not be surprising. Yeah. But, it, but that's very familiar. So, but, but understand that a lot of copycatism happens with cult leaders where, uh, yeah, cause I, th I think, um, Smith was way earlier than moon was even born. So the likelihood is that if if Smith said that in the 1800s, that Moon copied him as opposed to the other way around. Well, of course. Yeah, <laughs> he died of course. in 1844. Yeah. And I should also add that I was in leadership meetings where these very big shot people, I didn't know their names, but I knew on at least two, three occasions there were, there were Mormon higher ups that were meeting with Moon. Hmm. This yeah. is 74 to 76. Yeah, we often wonder how much lawyers and accountants and leaders of the LDS church meet with Scientology leaders, Jehovah's Witness leaders, because they all share similar experiences of like hiding abuse, of hiding their financial exactly. position, of marketing, uh, you know, in a, in a culture that's in and wanting to stop the ex members and the movement to expose brainwashing and mind control and right? protecting what they call religious freedom. Uh, right? Yeah, well, that's that's their rap, but uh, yeah, so um, so they collaborate. You're so saying. the the Moonies would back a lot of Mormon politicians. Orrin Hatch was someone that the Moonies adored, and they worked very closely together to name one person. Ooh, Ugh, that's a little gross. I don't know if I'm not supposed to talk no, about politics, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of dirty dealing happening with um, elitist billionaires who think that they're you know, and they're malignant narcissists. I should say that too. They don't they don't have empathy, and they don't care. They look at at people as objects for their use. Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating. Let's let's try to circle back to your story now. Okay. So, so you, uh, and and then I guess we didn't finish with with Reverend Moon. So at some point he moved oh, to I the hate U.S. When people call him a reverend, okay, <laughs> he never went to the seminary. He paid a few uh, tens of thousands of dollars to get an honorary degree. Okay, but he's not a reverend. I was a reverend. Yeah. He said we're reverends now. I was Reverend Stephen Hassan. It's like. <laughs> Okay, it's like Scientology. We're all religions. We're 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 in a religion now. So wow. so at some point, I guess he moved to the U.S. Is that right? Yes, he first came in '65, and I have some speeches, some copies of transcripts of speeches that were recorded and then printed up by the cult. Did he ever speak English? Is is very interesting because as a leader, I had access to all these documents they're called Master Speaks. And I have very early 70s before I got recruited where he's saying, I'm busily uh, studying English. That's the one thing that's going to help solve the, you know, speed up the restoration. And his English sucked. E yeah. Even, you know, throughout his life, he could barely articulate words and he always tried to pr promote a vision of him being superior at anything he did. And he couldn't drive a car because he would have to speed and beat everybody wherever he, I mean, this is one of the stories that, that members were, were told. But um, most of the time when, he, when I was in leadership meetings, it was clear he was hearing English and understanding it, but he would speak in Korean and someone would translate. And sometimes he would say one thing and what got translated it was obvious by okay. body language that it was not the same thing. One other quick parallel, the Mormon church considers itself a restorationist church. Mm. So we talk about the restoration all the time. And what we mean is, like you said, Jesus, Jesus's work fell into what's called apostasy, mm. and Joseph Smith was needed 
to restore Jesus's true church yeah. and then to finish the job. So in that sense, it's another very important important parallel between the Moonies and, and the Mormons. Yeah, I'm, I I really want to learn more about Mormonism. Uh, so yeah. I'm I'm very interested to learn anything you want to share. Well, we're we're well, sharing um, some parallels. Yeah, no, th this is really valuable. I, I I if I may just say quickly that I entered my professional career about the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Uh, it, it was asked to talk to a couple of girls about that. I know you don't want to talk about that, so I will, we'll get there. I'll, we'll get there. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for later. <laughs> okay. So you're converted at what age? I was 19 into the Moonies and I was deprogrammed uh, May 11th of 1976, just before my 22nd birthday. So three years. In the it's like it was closer to a little more than two years okay. and a little bit less than two and a half years. And did you say you dropped out of college? Yeah, they 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 asked me to uh, to drop out of Queens College and then go back and start a student club on campus called CARP. So I was the founder of of a recruitment entity at my former college where I would recruit students to drop out of college and join the messianic movement wow um i'm still curious what happened at your well maybe not second thing after the weekend where you had decided that you wanted to go back just out of curiosity to learn more what was that the the meeting or the day when there was a switch where it went it crossed over in your brain from just being curiosity to being converted or what was that transition <sighs> good question what I remember is them making explicit appeals that you just really need to do your due diligence, Steve, and learn more so you know what you're getting involved with. And, and if you don't like it, you can leave. So it was absolutely the opposite of we're asking you to commit your life forever to this organization. They didn't say at that early point, we want you to drop out of college or we want you to cut off contact with your family and friends because they're possessed by Satan. There was none of that. It was an appeal to, to why don't you take the time to understand the divine principle and really study it up? And I said, so who is the Messiah? We can't tell you. You need to pray about it and so study So they're holding more. information from you. Totally. Yeah. Totally. But again, I, I, I love to learn. I'm a curious person. And they're like, you need to figure this out, Steve, who the Messiah is. We can't tell you. Mm. So that was kind of the lure, uh, Samantha, to, to uh, okay, so I skipped a year. I, I was going to graduate college a year early. I have time. I'm going to just spend the, uh, you know another weekend to learn more. But by the end of that weekend, I, I was gone. You figured it out who the Messiah was? No, but I was like, I, 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 my memory is hazy about the specifics. I remember them saying, you know, uh, oh, they used the 40 day condition. They, they like to do numbers. And they said, you know, Jesus fasted for 40 days. Moses, um, uh, who met Moses fasted for 40 days to receive the 10 commandments. We think you should do a 40 day condition to not interact with your family or friends and just study the divine principle. That was the 40 days where I immersed myself into reading their scripture. They and have scripture. They have mm. a book called the divine principle, okay, yeah, yeah. hardcover black with gold lettering. Does it give you the answer to who the Messiah is? It doesn't, and, and and it doesn't explicitly say Sun Myung Moon, but it gives all. It leads you to the conclusion that there could be no one else. But later, I, as a leader, I I came to realize that the divine principle was different in different countries. Hmm. Like the Japanese culturally don't like the Koreans; they look down on the Koreans, and they're one of the biggest uh, strongholds of Mooney money is japan and we can talk about what's happening after the assassination of abe but um they definitely didn't want to talk about korea being you know the chosen nation or anything like so that in korea yeah yeah not at all 
what was your level of conversion at the start of the 40 days? Was how much of you was um, still thinking this was just an intellectual experiment? My recollection was uh, that was my frame, that I'll take time out from school and my family to study more. It was not like a formal baptism or, and I never went to a seven day workshop, which was extraordinary. People went to a three day, seven day, 21 day, 40. And then if you were a leader, 120 day training, I, I did two, three days and the rest was in individual grooming by the top leadership. So you went into the 40 days thinking maybe this is legitimate and mm -hmm. sort of the thing, but then by the end of the 40 days, Mm -hmm. fully converted yeah right and now. it was towards the end of that that they asked me to, to to they told me the abraham being asked to kill his son isaac story as an example of his true faith and they asked me what my isaac was and i said i don't know and they said we think your poetry is do you love god enough to sacrifice the thing you love the most mm. and i said yes and they said well go get your poetry throw it in that garbage can and i lost like 400 poems mm. and what? years of my writing that i never got back psychologically what what's that mechanism of what does that do for them to ask you to sacrifice something important to you why is that important well so on multiple levels but if you can get someone to do an extreme behavior there's a very powerful cognitive dissonance force to rationalize it and justify it and feel good about it and um they wanted to kill my pre moony self like everything got redefined as my satanic origin and I came to later be told that the Holocaust was necessary because the Jews didn't accept Jesus. Mm. The exact opposite of my entire childhood values and, mm. and beliefs. But part of the indoctrination is to create a pseudo identity in the image of the leader or the ideal member. So I was taught to think like moon and feel like moon and walk like moon and talk like moon. And I was, I was led to believe that Milton and Estelle were my physical parents, but Moon and his wife were my true parents. There was a lot of parental and, and being a good child of God. So regression to childhood appeals in the indoctrination of the cult. Um, but what I want to say is that the projection that one has um if you are told this is the lord of love who's the most perfect being on earth i can generate and i did generate a lot of projection of what how great this person was as opposed to I, this is another billionaire business person who's overweight and is arrogant <laughs> But I mean, I was, I was later in these leadership meetings where I could like see he had wax in his ears and he hadn't cleaned them or he had BO or he did a fart and he didn't say excuse me to anyone because like we were nothing and he was the Messiah. You know, but a lot of things get suppressed because you're you're in this new identity and you're taught any negative thought is satan or evil spirits invading you in fact in 74 uh the new york membership were taken to greenwich village they had rented an entire movie theater to watch the exorcist movie and then we all went up in vans to tarrytown and moon gave a speech how god made the exorcist and this movie is a prophecy of what will happen if you leave the unification church and I can cite that, that experience as the beginning of me consciously turning off any doubts because I was that afraid of demonic possession. Even though a few months earlier mm. before the cult, I didn't believe in Satan or devils or demons at all, mm. like zero. <laughs> so you just rifle up for me a bunch of parallels that I just 
when, when I interview ex cult members, I like to draw attention to. Sure. So like, you know, hero worship check for Mormonism, whether it's Joseph Smith or the current prophet, yep. they speak to and for God and they're next to God or Jesus mm. in righteousness. Mm. There's even accounts of Joseph Smith boasting to be superior to Jesus in some ways. So that. Oh, oh Moon did that too, yeah. by the way. No, no, and, no, I know. And, and superior to God in yeah. at, at some speeches. So, so there's parallels there for me. There's definitely parallels of, you know, the, the most, probably the most famous Mormon childhood song is I am a child of God. Mm. And I think we're, we all have such a positive association with that song growing up that um because it, it's with our childhood and there's a loving heavenly father and and, and who does it and a loving heavenly mother and who doesn't love that but what i'm just now realizing is there's a psychological purpose of a song like that mm -hmm. because it basically says you know heavenly father and heavenly mother are more important than your own parents yep and then but the, it, and that's a fact i don't think there's any mormon that's going to disagree mm. that if you have to choose between heavenly father and heavenly mother and your own parents you choose heavenly father and your and heavenly mother but the, but the rub is that who is it that tells you what Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother want for you? It's the church leaders. So in that way, there's some soft parental alienation that isn't quite as hard as maybe Scientology or the mm -hmm. movies. But for me, it's there. Samantha, does that ring true for you or not? Yeah, and also in a way infantilization, because I didn't grow up with the song I Am a Child of God, but it songs like that being introduced to my psyche they do take you back to those younger versions of yourself where you know it's appropriate for you to be codependent and kind of sort of prime you for just that yeah more childlike state where you feel like you need to look to these perfect parent figures so you you also r reminded me that so much of the Mooney experience was singing holy songs. Mm -hmm. There was a whole Music. booklet of holy songs, and um, so we would do pledge service on Sunday at five thirty and bow to an altar with this picture on it and recite a pledge to fight for our life for God and the fatherland, which was Korea, etc. But whenever we would, you know, go and hear Moon speak or mm. any of the leaders, we would be singing holy songs for two, three hours before they would appear, just to warm up the environment. And um, this is an un yet to be really researched and documented area of cult mind control is the use of music yeah. because it affects our brain and yeah. emotional level deeply 100%. so like one of one of the songs uh is heavenly soldiers yeah uh in the moonies like but a lot of things about being a child and if you think developmentally if you want to if you want to control a person reduce them to childhood and be their parental yeah substitute no, then they're they're going to be Really Easy quickly, to just, apply it. yeah, it's beautiful. Really quick, just to note a couple <clears throat> of other things. Sure. This idea that negative thoughts are satanic, super Mormon, right? Oh, very, yeah. Yeah, like in Mormonism, contention is of the devil. And anytime you feel yucky, that's the Holy Ghost telling you to run away. But once you've been conditioned into Mormonism, yeah. of course, anything against Mormonism is going to make you feel yucky. So you're always primed to run away from anything that would. Yeah, and you're taught to do thought stopping or emotion blocking because you want to stay pure. Yeah. You want to stay aligned with your, you know, your your mission and 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 God's spirit. And then the Exorcist story reminds me of fear and conditioning through fear, and with music that you know the bite model the E is emotion. Fear is one emotion that it's you can be controlled with. It's the biggest universal mind control technique is what I call phobia indoctrination. And with Mormonism, it's that you won't be with your your children or your parents or your siblings in the afterlife, right? Mm. So it's it's fear of not making it to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom with all your family. So that's the dark side of fear-based emotional manipulation. There's, a, there's positive emotion that we're manipulated with as well. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir is one of the world's most famous choirs. Right. We all sing from a very young age primary songs that indoctrinate us. And, you know, we're conditioned to sing in choirs and to love music. And that music yeah. evokes positive emotion, which then we associate, we're taught that whenever you feel positive emotion, that means the church is true. Yep. 
And Samantha, I know you wanted to jump in there. Sorry, this is a separate point, but I also think it's interesting. You're not Korean, but the Moonies had you putting Korea on this pedestal as, you know, the most important country. And I'm not American, <laughs> but I'm being conditioned to put America on this pedestal. Not so much while as a Mormon in England, but yeah, once it can, cults can even get you to embrace nationalism for a country that isn't yours. Nationalism yes, for a point. Of, Which you would think you would have something in your brain being like, mm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that random country is probably not the best country yeah. in the whole world. Yeah, but. nationalism of the founder. And if you read even the Mormon scriptures, Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about the Constitution and how God prepared the United States to be the place where the true church would be restored. Mm. And that's a fantastic parallel. Yeah. Thanks, Samantha, the Good nationalism. Point. Good point, Samantha. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know pledges like Mormons recite. There's the young women's pledge that the young women's recite mm -hmm. every week, mm -hmm. right? Men have pledges. You know, missionaries have pledges, and so I don't mean to like to be doing parallelism to to sort of reinforce my own biases, but I am hearing a lot of parallels. I mean, is it a bias or is it just noticing relevant parallels? Yeah, I agree with Samantha on that one. <laughs> it's yeah. not a bias to say two plus two equals four. It's not five. It's not three. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's there are these formulaic destructive authoritarian cult practices, and that's part of the power of, of I know we're going to talk about my work later, but to see it in another group allows one a perspective on one's own experience in a that where you can see it in a different way. Yeah. Well, may, maybe let's just take a second to introduce the BITE model. We've talked about it before. B stands for behavior. I stands for information and the control of it. T stands for thoughts. Right. And E stands for emotions. Control of thoughts and manipulation through emotion. What were the, like Mormonism is like, don't drink coffee, don't drink tea, don't drink alcohol, you know, um, stay sexually pure, no masturbation, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I Chastity never masturbated one time in two and a half years. So what were the Not big, a single time. what were the big behavioral no-nos? I had two nocturnal emissions and I had to fast for three days <laughs> and take a cold shower till I turned purple. Sorry, I had to just. No, that's great. What were the big behavioral no-nos within the Moonies? The way they <clears> controlled you? With behavior was it address well was it you know first of stuff? all a universal mind control thing is sleep manipulation and deprivation so as a good moony we were told father only sleeps three to four hours a night i was trained to be like father therefore i would sleep three to four hours a night so i was sleep deprived and we know for sure through neuroscience that you're not using your cortical <laughs> your frontal cortex when you're sleep deprived yeah. you just are not able to think clearly dumber. and i uh, that was my state for two and a half years there were a few exceptions where i got very sick and i slept for a week i had tonsillectomy uh i slept for a week through that but other than that i was chronically sleep deprived you know, there was rigid rules of where you slept, what you ate, how you dressed. What were you not supposed to eat? What were you not supposed to eat? Um, or what were you supposed to eat? Do you remember? It's a good question. Mostly in the Moonies, the leaders got very fancy restaurant food, and often the Moonies got McDonald's mm. or rice dishes. I learned to eat sushi in the Moonies, and the Moonies are very big in the fishing industry. Um, a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Well, is that part of the doctrine or the theology? What you should and no, eat? I don't think it was a doctrinal thing. It was more like we, you know, we need to save money. Regality. To, you know, but in the meantime, Moon has Lincoln Continental stretch limousines and yachts. And mansions, multi-million dollar mansions, and we're sleeping on sleeping bags on the floor, mm. you know, freezing cold. But for me, um, you always had, oh, this is an important part of the, the uh, doctrine, which I forgot to mention. So in the Mooney theology, because uh, Cain killed Abel, and Abel was the preferred child of God, all of the restoration had to be that uh, Cain had to submit to Abel. 
And so in the Moonies, all relationships were described as Cain Abel relationships or chapter two relationships. Cain Abel were authority subordinate issues like you always had to obey your leader even if he told you something stupid or something that was wrong to do you were expected to follow blindly i'll give you a quick example of that uh, i was in a put on a, fun, a mobile fundraising team as part of breaking a person's ego to be on the street selling chocolates or candies or candles and i was put under someone who was a, a new captain on a van and he dropped me off to go into a bar at like three in the afternoon and i said you know there's nobody in the bar this time of day why don't you drop me off at the stoplight because i can make a lot more money that was reported back to the superior who yelled at me because I was faithless. How did I know if I went in that I wouldn't have gotten a hundred dollar donation from a single person that I needed to just blindly obey? So that was inculcated over and over again. I lost my train of thought. No, in, in Mormon, you were, why were you nodding your head, Samantha? Just um, the just the follow the leader even if he's wrong oh yeah so so cain abel so everything was like submission to whoever was designated as your authority figure even if they didn't know what they were talking about and the other was a chapter two problem which is in the divine principle is the fall of man that you having lust so in my experience in the moonies i was never allowed to be in a room alone with a woman because she might rape me or seduce me and like, I have two older sisters. I grew up with women. I loved sex. I, you know, but this was like, no, man is subject, woman is object. Man gives love, woman gives beauty. And this whole very patriarchal, uh, you know, thing going on. But um, I want to mention those two concepts and just link it to loaded language because thought control, if you can reduce the complexity of human interaction into these labels or into these boxes, it's, it's, um, it's easier to manipulate and control people's identities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So strong sexual controls? There was no sex. And I couldn't hug a woman, a friend, or whatever. Without marriage. Yeah, and even if you were married, you had to get permission <clears throat> to, to kiss your wife or, or have marital relations. There were strict positions. They were not for oral sex. They were not for women on top. You know, missionary position, et cetera. Again, I got out before I was married, so this is not something I have direct experience about. Yeah, so Mormonism forbade oral sex until there was a revolt in the church, but masturbation to this day is forbidden. Yeah. And premarital sex is forbidden. So, Matthew, yeah. did you want to um, Were you saying that you couldn't hug men either? Or no, you could hug men. You could hug men a you bit. You could hug men. So, you so, had some physical touch. So, I had some, but was very rare. But I want to just tell you a story of my friend Alan Wood, who was a top leader. Uh, who left just before I joined because he said they were making people into Nazis, Steve, like you. Um, and Alan tells the story of being with Moon where he says, and he was the head of the political arm uh, of the Moonies in the U.S. He said, Father, what do we do about uh, homosexuals? How do we help these people? And Moon's response was, tell them if it becomes a problem to cut it off, barbecue it, put it in a shoebox and send it to me. Holy moly. And Alan said when he heard that, he knew he needed to leave the cult. A very homophobic cult. And they would do conversion uh, things and abstinence pledges, you know, go around in schools to tell people never to have premarital sex. And Oh, so yeah. Sexual control. Very homophobic. Homophobia. Check, check. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So. Well, it's not okay, but you're right. saying, yeah, <laughs> check. I'm saying check. We have those in common. Yes. We never have a leader. I guess we never had leaders explicitly tell gay men to cut off their penises, right? Um, I suppose not. 
But there were things like, was it Boyd K. Packer who um, essentially endorsed a missionary companion punching his companion for finding out he's gay? Yeah. Things yeah. like that. Right. Yeah, you know, and we, I, I, I want to someday have a conversation with you just about the parallels and the differences, but there's so many parallels. Mormonism takes a bit of a softer approach with mm. the same mindset, mm. just a bit of a softer hand well, which now. I think allows it to be more wealthy and powerful and successful. Mm -hmm. So there's so many parallels, but it's always with a tiny bit of a softer edge. And you're saying now. Yeah, but I mean, if you go back to Joseph Smith or Brigham's time, or you know, that, that kind Earlier. of polygamy times at least, it, it oh, yeah. wasn't as soft as it is today. No, Brigham Young would say if you catch a if, if yeah. a black man and a woman are having sex, like javelin, Blood atonement. javelin yeah. through the heart is their only atonement, you know, kind of weird. Things. Yeah, murder is merciful if someone's been sinful. Yeah, enough. so I mean, so like, so we talk about Mormonism being, you know, because it has had to become softer because it's wanted to be so mainstream. But like, the majority of the existence of Mormonism hasn't really been like that. Has been in some ways as horrific as Reverend yeah. Moon or Leader yeah. Moon. What do I call him? Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon. Is my preferred Mr. Moon was, yeah. I'm triggering Steve when I say Reverend. <laughs> no, Moon. you don't trigger me. It's just it gives him a credibility. He doesn't earn. He never earned. And Language he is doesn't powerful, deserve. John. <laughs> yeah, and 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 cult propagandists want to promote it as a legitimate religion, and I don't think it is. I really don't. I want to add one more parallel. So I was at a leadership meeting with Moon. And typically men sat on one side of the room and women were on the other side of the room. Which and, is how Mormon temples are organized. And I was, yeah, and I was sitting and a black sister, her name was Patricia, was like within eye shot of me. And this is a speech that got printed up so I can document what I'm about to say. I'm paraphrasing. But he said... You know, when you think about the races, the Orientals are blessed in the spiritual area and and Caucasians mm. in the, the scientific area and black people in the area of physical education, you can know by how many black people are in basketball. And I remember looking at her and she looking at me like, did we just hear what we just heard, like I grew up in Queens and it was very racially diverse place. So hanging out with black people and Asian people was very normal for me as a child. But he was literally saying black people, you know, weren't intelligent and <laughs> as, as a race. And it was like, what the? Jack, I mean, we, Racial. Yeah, we could find quotes paralleling that quite easily. Absolutely. Well, you yeah. you reminded me yeah, of yeah. that. Later, the Moonies did a big push to try to redo that image and <laughs> started going to black churches, offering to buy them new roofs or what do you need in order to recruit black people. Steve, it was just announced this week that our prophet, our current prophet, Russell M. Nelson, is receiving like the Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King award for like racial healing have we got to the know? bottom of that like who's been paid <laughs> I that don't know. who who is looking at <laughs> russell m nelson it has to be paid for yeah right? it's but, it's really dirty but but stuff. it's part of a rebranding it's rebranding that's a, it's pr <laughs> public relations so you're so the moonies went through something very similar yeah so i want to also point out that the that after this congressional investigation happened, they said, we found so much wrongdoing that an interagency task force should be set up with, and they named about six or seven branches of government. And nothing was ever done except for that he um, uh, was engaged in a conspiracy to avoid paying income taxes, where he went to jail for 13 months. Uh, and I can, and, and the Moonies all believe he was persecuted because he was a religious Asian leader. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that when he went to jail, they did this huge rebranding. They spent $30 million in PR. And at that point, they said calling anyone a Mooney is like calling a black person the N word. We've literally heard that around the Mormon rebrand. Russell Nelson, as soon as he became prophet, said, that 
that using the term Mormon as a self-identification tool is mm. is a victory for Satan. Mm. Wow. And and certain uh, zealous Mormons on Twitter, I've seen them say that it's like calling a black person the N-word. It's a slur. Yeah. So I continue to talk about them as the Moonies, because when I was in, Moon was so happy that we were called Moonies. We had <laughs> cups with I heart Mooney. I had t-shirts with I love to be a Moonie. Didn't and expect I'm like, this level of parallels. Oh, no, it was yeah. very... Down to that nitty gritty detail. No, we we the Mormon Church had an I'm a Mormon campaign and uh Billion you know, dollars. Meet, the Mor meet the mormons <laughs> Times square i'm a mormon singing, i'm a mormon yes yep. i am yep. and now it's evil but but it but it is when your church hits so much bad pr and gets such a bad reputation and by the way we just settled with the security and exchange commission for a five million dollar fine for de deceiving the public and the membership about our our vast financial holdings you still talk about our <laughs> yeah yeah i have a cultural mormon for sure and i still consider this my people i find that interesting john, <laughs> Me too, psycho john. maybe <laughs> psycho maybe we'll talk about someone it someone in my corner around here <laughs> <laughs> but but the point is like our reputation has gotten so problematic that that it's got to be the getting rid of eschewing the mormon identity like you say like the moonies is an attempt to rebrand because it's just it doesn't sell mm -hmm. right the mormon identity no longer sells well i would like to think from my perspective that your podcast mormon stories podcast played a role in them <laughs> saying we need to not use the word mormon anymore well of course i want to believe that no i really i'm <laughs> saying that not just as i'm saying that as an observer <laughs> of the field um but I didn't know, I didn't think of the Mormons as a mind control cult until the Ex-Mormon Foundation brought me out in the mm -hmm. early 2000s. Yeah. And I met 250 former Mormons, many fourth, fifth generation. And I'm talking about the bite model and, 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 and they're like, everyone's nodding <laughs> in the audience. Like, and that was right as I was going through my faith crisis. Like I went through my faith crisis in 2001 I remember Richard Packham and Sue yeah, that's, and the Ex-Mormon Foundation. That's who brought me out. And I watched you give that talk right when I was going through my faith crisis. What year did you come out again? I want to say it was 2002 or yeah, something like right that. There, yeah. I also want to tell you the fellow who spoke after me blew my mind. I don't remember his name, but he had been a, a professor or a teacher at a Mormon training institute. Mm -hmm. And the title of his talk, I'm sure the video is still online, was something like Deception as a Management Tool of the LDS Church. Mm, yeah. And he did this presentation starting with all the lies from Joseph Smith. And he gets to the end where he has a recording of him with his boss where he is saying, so you're telling me that I have to lie to my students about the, the truth about Mormon history to keep my job? And the boss said, that's correct. And he mm. said, well, I quit. Mm. <laughs> that was the end yeah. of it. And, but when I listened to this lecture, I'm like, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, mm. feathers like a duck. I guess mm. it seems to really fit. I had always known, not always, but I saw a PBS special on the, the two-year missionary training that was flat out like the Moonies. Like that was a mind control two year thing but i didn't i didn't i needed to learn from former members more about mainstream mormonism yeah well, another parallel is that joseph smith was also incarcerated multiple times like mr. oh Moon, yes except mr we we one up you because joseph smith was killed sort of in an apocalyptic meltdown mm. and mr moon was able to live to a ripe old age is that yeah right? he got very demented but he did have multiple sexual partners uh, yeah. Yes, he, he had at least one child out of wedlock. His name is Sammy Pock, who was raised by Bohe Pock, his main um, translator, who is also the KCIA CIA liaison person in the South Korean embassy in the early 60s. Mm. So he, he had a child out of wedlock and, and was raised. And the, guy, the kid didn't know until his 20s. All right, so while we're giving you a break, Samantha, uh, we've got a lot of cool comments coming in um any any thoughts or reflections samantha um uh i i guess i guess 
the leaving faithful Mormons, Samantha might accuse us a little bit of parallelism where we're just like picking cherry picking parallels. But, uh, is that softball? Did I just ask you a softball? God. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, well, the parallels are extensive. I mean, we're not just talking about things that, you know, quite a lot of, but even something like no sexual activity, that is an extreme rule, but even that, which might be somewhat pervasive across religions, although still high demand religions, which is no small thing. We're even talking down to the name of, down to the thing of not calling them the Moonies anymore. Come on. It doesn't get more. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird how patterns just repeat over and over, you know, unbeknownst to to people like Russell M. Nelson isn't really conscious of of why he well I suppose he might be conscious of why he hates the term Mormons seems like he's had that one for decades it's been his personal beef but yeah yeah but the parallels are uncanny the parallels are extensive they they are both micro and macro and you you cannot you can't intelligently analyze life without looking at patterns like that is how we build our understanding of the world is identifying patterns and and you know categorizing things and understanding things um along a continuum like we have to do it so it's certainly not cherry picking um because we're we're just talking about so much of the same things and the same psychological mechanisms and you know yeah and what? we're also not in denial about the fact that, you know, we can obviously say, yes, Scientology is, it seems like a worse cult <laughs> or is, you know, higher along on that influence continuum. And it sounds like the Moonies potentially, depending, probably higher up the Mormonism. Like we can still recognize that. We can still recognize the ways that um, Mormonism is better. Like I've said this on, uh, on the Zelf YouTube channel, but if I was an ex-Scientologist, I wouldn't have a YouTube channel about it, you know? So we can still see the ways that Mormonism is a bit softer, at least in 2023. Because obviously, again, if you're living under theocratic Brigham Young, completely different story. You could get killed for leaving the church or speaking out. But yeah. 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 Samantha, I don't know if you know this, but just while Steve's out, one massive parallel is wealth. Mm. Do, you, do you know about sushi and the Moonies? Do you know about that parallel? No, but I was interested because you said the Moonies are huge in the fishing okay. industry. Yeah. So I'm sharing, I'll share right now in the comments, one of the most amazing hours of podcasts I've ever listened to. It's it's called, uh, it's from the New York Times, the daily podcast, and it's called The Untold Story of Sushi in America. And Samantha, I'll just give you the high level. Okay. And this will make you never want to eat sushi again. But you're a vegan, well, so you vegan. probably don't. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, um, at some point, <coughs> Moon, Mr. Moon, decides he wants to bring sushi. Because before the early 80s, I guess sushi wasn't a huge deal in the United States. Mm. But Moon comes from Korea and, um, you know, liked sushi. And so he just decides he's going to bring, he's going to single-handedly bring sushi to the United States. And so he like, he picks like a hundred and I'm, I'm making up the details it to, based on my memory, but it's generally right. He like picks a hundred of his leaders at some meeting and he gives them each a hundred dollars. And he says, go to, go to Lincoln, Nebraska, go to Dallas, Texas, go to, you know, Oklahoma city, Oklahoma, here's a hundred bucks and start a sushi restaurant. And over time, all of his, a ton of his leaders start building sushi restaurants. And then guess what? All these sushi restaurants need raw fish to supply the sushi outlets. And so fast forward, long story short, the Unification Church built up a fish wholesaling empire that to this day feeds Whoa. some crazy percentage, like between 60 and 80% of the sushi that we consume in the United States is served through the Mooney organization and it's made them a multi-billion dollar corporation. Does that sound that familiar? That is really wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and just, and, and it became a problem because when Mr. Moon dies, his, his like current wife, she wants to take over the sushi industry, but is, you know, some of his children are with her, but some of his other children, maybe with previous wives, I'm not sure. And there's a, both questions about, who succeeds with the church, but almost more importantly is 
who succeeds with the sushi empire. Mm -hmm. So just like Joseph Smith had a succession crisis, this podcast goes into the succession crisis. Is it the wife that takes over? Who's the heir to the the sushi fortune? Is it this other son? And who's the heir, you know, to to the leadership? That's quite a movie storyline, you know? Yeah, it's fascinating. Quite the... And and I we had sushi with Steve last night. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, at, at tsunami. So not, and it's it's all just so wild as well because you just think of these groups, such as the you know the way the Mormons are viewed in England, but the Moonies too. It's like you think of them as so obscure and tiny, and I suppose they are relative to how many people exist. But they're so effective at gaining influence and power and wealth that despite being such a tiny subset of the population. You have no idea the level of influence they have over your like how many people in America know about the Mooney's connection to sushi? Probably barely any. I learned like last year. Yeah. And I'm 53. I love you know learning I mean? about cults and I just learned <laughs> that right now. Yeah, yeah. It's a big deal. So, so just Steve- the amount of the amount that these obscure groups will have, you know, their fingers in the pies of our lives and we don't even know it. Yeah. Yeah, so Steve, while you were taking a break, and we're inhumane on Mormon stories, and we just go. We hit record, and we just go. And if you don't mind me going to the restroom, <laughs> I'm fine with that. I just told Samantha the story of sushi, the the Moonies and sushi that I learned from the Daily, the New York Times Daily podcast about, I guess, I guess it says. It was, that, it was in their magazine, I think. It's online. It's an actual print thing, and then they did a. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, in, in this story, and maybe so you knew you knew Mr. Moon, like you met him and were in, in the room with him. You weren't many just, times. Yeah, and and the, the Holy Family, including the two sons who have a gun factory in Pennsylvania and a cult worshiping AR-15s. Yeah, we can talk about that tomorrow. Okay, so. So I guess I was just telling her that according to the story, he just like gives a hundred bucks to like a hundred of his followers and says, go start sushi restaurants throughout the world or throughout the United States. Long story short, they become the suppliers of sushi restaurants and corner like 60 to 80% of the sushi market, right? Well, they have the largest fish processing plant in the world in Kodiak, Alaska. They have a boat building business. They were putting people out catching tuna off of uh, Massachusetts or out of Gloucester because there were regulations, one tuna per boat. So they made these smaller boats, would send the member out, catch a tuna, come back in, send another boat out with a different member. Of course, the members were not given their pay because they were church members so they would donate their so they were undercutting legitimate fishermen fisher people anyway there's so many illegal immoral things that this group has been involved with really a lot of devious destructive horrible things including um you know funding uh terrorist groups and neo-nazi types of operations in their quest to be anti-communist hmm. and they're they're still world players to this day so that idea of unpaid labor whether it's missionaries paying to be missionaries in the mormon religion yeah. or senior missionaries after yeah. they've after they've retired paying in their retirement to to literally do corporate jobs for the church as a religious mission but they're literally serving in corporate functions it's it's, i think it violates labor law yeah labor trafficking law we want to say something i just have a question and maybe this is skipping ahead if so we can put a pin in it but is it scary to talk out about the moonies because i always i was saying to john before while you were away if i was an ex-scientologist i wouldn't do a youtube channel about scientology i'd just go quietly into the night mormonism is kind of one of those ones where you can get away with it i mean john has for 20 years without it being too much of a risk to your life what's what's the deal with the moonies because i know you mentioned earlier that you would have killed for them if you'd been asked to uh, they... well, i was yeah i was i was uh, i was thinking also about your comment about my allegiance to korea uh and and the idea that i would the world would be speaking the korean language only when the when moon took over uh, I remember Moon saying that if North Korea invaded South Korea, they would send all the Americans to the front line to be martyrs to get America in the land war in Asia. I was like, yes, father, <laughs> Munse, which is victory in Korea. Munse. Um, 
So the my story is that when I first left, they didn't believe I left because I was such a fanatical devotee. They thought I had been brainwashed by my deprogrammers. Can, can we hold that? Go no no no. Can we just describe what your three years as a Mooney were like before we talk about you leaving it? We'll come right to that as the exact next thing. But like, what r major roles did you play for the Moonies? You'll, you'll have to remind okay. me to come Pins, back. We yeah. will. We will point. for sure. Okay. But just for the chronology, like, what roles did you play? What 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 things did you do? What were your observations of Mr. Moon? And how scary and dangerous and troubling did it get? And then we'll talk about how you left. And then we'll talk about Samantha's question. So I was almost always in New York at Queens or Manhattan. Um, I was mostly involved with recruiting and indoctrinating people. Uh, I did some political activism, for example, fasting for Nixon during Watergate because God said <laughs> he wants Nixon to be president despite mm -hmm. Watergate. And a quick funny story with my dad who had voted for Nixon. I voted for McGovern and said, Nixon's a crook. Like, how could you vote for this creep? I thought wrongly as a Mooney that he would be pleased that I was supporting Nixon. And I called him from, from Washington. I said, I'm fasting for Nixon. He says, Steve, you are right. He's a crook. I'm like, no, dad, you don't understand. God wants him to be president. And he's like, Steve, he's a crook. Now I know you're brainwashed in any case. So back to my things. I also did, I was in charge of um, transportation for a seven day fast in front of the United Nations through a front group that had been concocted to try to get them to stop uh, to, to stop a motion to withdraw UN troops for, for human rights violations in South Korea. That was successful. But mostly I was um, telling them how to recruit Americans and telling them, you know, what would work and what wouldn't work. And I was sent to set up CARP at Queens College. Then I was made to be assistant director of the Flushing Center. Then Moon decided he would move the national headquarters from D.C. to New York to be closer to him. He didn't like the president of the Moonies because he was thought too much for himself. What do you mean the president of the Moonies? Uh, the guy named Neil Salonen was the American head of the Unification Church. And so the headquarters was moved up and I was told to be the internal Abel to Neil Salonen you know, Abel and Cain, like I was going to be his superior and I, they wanted him to learn from me how to be obedient and mindless basically. So I was assistant director of church 10 at national headquarters. Wait, I, so Moon put the leader of the Moonies in the U S under you? Spiritually. Wow. When you're like 20, but you have to understand I was really a good Mooney. <laughs> I'll give you a quick story. Um, so the Moonies will also do a lot of street fundraising. They were making $30 million uh, a year in cash, selling chocolates, candies, candles, flowers, lying, saying it was for Christian youth programs. And so for ego de deconstruction, even leaders were sent out to do fundraising. So, you know, you just, you couldn't complain. You had to just follow the orders and be obedient and do your job. So it's pouring rain. It's the west side of Manhattan. And I'm at a stoplight and I see this Lincoln Continental over there. It stopped at the red light and I recognize it's father and mother. It's a Saturday night. I run over to the car. You have to get this image. This um, this this guy's bowing to a Lincoln Continental, you know, the, where the passengers are. The the window comes down. He's beaming, smiling, and I'm like, "Father, mother, would you like chocolate or would you like mints?" Oh, give me the chocolate. Here's a 20. And he gives me a $20 bill and takes it. And then the window goes up. He drives off. He's going, I guess, to the theater or something. And then the next morning, a Sunday morning, which was the typical gathering of all the membership, he says, 
And if you're pure in heart, you might get a blessing like Steve Hassan did last night. And then he describes it to the membership. And it was like, oh, you fundraised the Messiah? It's like, yes, it's what God wanted me to do. Was, but you have to, I'm, I'm painting this picture that I was just really a true believer. Like if I'd stayed in for 10 years, would I have still been that fanatical? I don't know. I don't think mm. so, but I could have been. Mm. But um, I lost my train of thought. What was so I saying you were before? Just all, you were going through all the different roles. Oh, yeah. So program. mostly I was in leadership and, and you know, thinking about how, to, how, and Moon was giving talks about infiltrating Congress and uh, how we need to control the government and and uh, how democracy was satanic. And, um, you know, and so, um, and then a, a very odd thing happened that didn't make sense until much later after my deprogramming, but I was lecturing at a lecture hall opposite the main public library in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue. And I was given a stipend, and I decided to go and buy some history textbooks. Remember I mentioned earlier about the historical time parallels? And now I said, go to the library and check it out. These parallels are true. So I thought I would bolster my lecture with some facts from these books. <laughs> and I asked my leader, I said, excuse me, but th this history textbook doesn't <laughs> support the divine principle. And within a few hours, I was pulled aside and told that they just found out my parents were trying to kidnap me and deprogram me. It was crucial that I leave the, you know, the New York immediately and go to Pennsylvania. And I never put the two together until years later that I had asked, I had pointed out the crack in the wall that would have like blown up the belief that this was the truth. It was an intentional lie, right? But they distracted me. They put me on a fundraising team. Then they made me the head of a, a fundraising team. And it was in that period that my leader said everyone on my team had to make a minimum of $100 a day. Otherwise, they couldn't sleep. And me being the good leader, if my members didn't sleep, I wouldn't sleep either. I was sleeping three to four hours a night normally. Now I'm up for th for almost three days with no sleep. And I wake up as I'm driving into the back of a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour. Slam on the brakes. The thing's a pancake and they have to rescue me. And when this comes back to the question about am I, am I afraid of being assassinated? Because when I first left... They literally went like this to me when I was out protesting one of the mass weddings. But I had survived this. this. By the way, that's a sign that I did in the Mormon temple, mm. slitting my throat. Oh, as that, as proof that as, as a as a threat that we assign to ourselves if yeah. we ever divulge the secrets of the temple. Oh, that's a good. That's a good. Not good one, but that's a relevant point to this story. But I kind of felt like I should have died in that van crash. Like the people who saved my lives, so they thought it would blow up. Were like, "You're alive! It's amazing that you lived through it." So I kind of like had my my brush with death and I've kind of made my peace with death. So I've never been afraid with death threats and I'm like, bring it on. Right. Mm -hmm. More, the more you harass me, the more I'm going to yeah. speak out. Yeah. And I made a very deliberate conscious d d decision to make an ex member group. So if I died, it would be clear other people would speak. So it wouldn't just be silenced. I also, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so thank you for sharing that um, and so many parallels. But just to circle back to the bite model, the eye is information. It sounds like the Mooney religion had withheld really oh, no, important information from you and deceived you with information. Absolutely. And then worked really hard to prevent you from learning the things that then would allow 
or the T in the bite model, the thoughts that maybe the church wasn't what it claimed to be. Is that so? A fair but, the, but I would add there are other things in the I, like extensive propagandizing and not having ex access to TV or newspapers or any other sources of information, having people spy on each other and report if they see anybody violating any rules, uh, you know, is very important. Any information you would tell them would be used to manipulate you if you got out of line or any type of problem um and um yeah just extensive indoctrination like hours and hours of moon speeches or or listening to lectures or reading doc doctrines etc people were always kept busy um there was no vacation time oh you can take a couple of weeks off like didn't exist um and there was this always this urgency Oh, and the other thing is they would always make a goal and then up it. So this and and Lifton later talked about uh, demand for purity. The idea is we want you to bring three people a week to the introductory lecture. So I'd bring three people, and it's like, well, bring five, <laughs> bring seven, bring ten. You know, and I, I had recruited 13 direct uh, uh, disciples. They called them spiritual children who and, and, and at the point that I got my first spiritual children, I, that was another moment of my indoctrination where I was like, I was told, you don't want to show any doubts at all because you're a parent now and you don't want to harm your spiritual child and interfere with their faith journey. So therefore, that was another level of an, an involvement. And indeed, later when I studied psychology, it's, it's, it's a very powerful you know, re, um, recruiting other people into the cult is a very powerful reinforcer into your cult identity and your involvement. We say Mormonism these days, the Mormon missionary program is far more for the missionaries than it is to mm. bring converts to the church. Mm. Interesting. Samantha, any parallels that are striking with you just over the past well, five, 10 minutes? I was minutes? just thinking about how on Mormon missions, I think a lot of people have this mindset of if, you know, if they wake up two minutes late past the fixed time you're supposed to wake up, then maybe that will prevent someone's soul from being saved that day or there is that oh, idea that if you don't rigidly adhere to these arbitrary rules, then you might put someone else's salvation in jeopardy. And that, yeah, that definitely keeps people. Absolutely. Off. So I want to say, even when with fundraisers, where you're asking someone to give two bucks for a 15 cent piece of chocolate, it is believed that you're giving them a ticket to heaven because you're getting them to do a good deed that connects you to the Messiah. Yeah. And there was even a movie called Ticket to Heaven. Um, but that was the the notion. And yeah, it was not only recruiting that person, but all their ancestors were like starving in low levels of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 I took it very seriously. And I did to others what was done to me. I lied, I manipulated, because the ends justify the means. You consciously lied? My Mooney identity, this is the mentality, Satan deceived Adam and Eve away from God, so God needs to deceive Satan's children away from Satan to God. Uh, that is the explicit teaching. Yeah, and we call it lying for the Lord. Yeah. Heavenly deception was the term. That was the, Mo the Mooney's term. The Christians call it transcendental trickery. And on it goes. Mm. So, okay. So you have this big car crash. Um, well, let me just say this. Two quick things, and then I want to go to your leaving the Moonies. Mm. Um, did, like, I think about Malcolm X and when he discovered for the first time that uh, Elijah Muhammad had a mistress and had had babies with his mistress kind of thing. Mm. Did you ever learn anything about mr moon that was like either through books you read or things you heard about his sexual history or whatever that while you were a moony made you wonder whether he was actually fallen or corrupt as a leader or did you ever just observe i never had conscious behavior? doubts 
I suppressed them. I did thought stopping. Moonies are trained to do um, chants to themselves, like crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to heaven, peace on earth, glory to heaven, peace on earth, true parents, true parents. So you were taught these thought stopping techniques, which is a behavior modification technique to stay pure. There was one episode where a member asked me, is it true that father was married before true mother? Because you hadn't been taught that he had been married before. Not at all. So that, so was withheld, I, that information was withheld from you, his previous marriage. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, he was the sinless, you know, most pure, most perfect human being ever on earth. Ever. Better than Jesus, because Jesus failed, because... He should have been married and had perfect children and sinless children. But um, so I remember asking my leader, Kamiyama, about was father married before? And he said, yes, but it's not good to tell members that. That was one of the few moments where he t intentionally said, lie to the members. Don't, don't reveal this. Yeah. And you probably know this because I think I talked about it in your interview with me, but I was 31 before I ever read anything specifically about Joseph Smith's 30 plus wives. Yeah. Like in all my time as a Mormon, any additional wife of Joseph Smith's was literally never mentioned in yep. church ever. Yep. And if you talked about it, you would have been punished. Yep. You know, that's a parallelism. <laughs> okay. All right. So, how in the world? Did you lose your faith and extricate yourself? You, you said you got to the point where you, where you literally would have killed for Mr. Moon? Did, I, was I was a security guard on a few occasions, and it would have been an honor to jump in front of him and take a bullet or, you know, take a gun and shoot somebody who was trying to harm father or mother or whatever. So you would have died or killed for him. But I, I mean, I, I, even early on, I was told, we'll, we'll send Americans to the front lines of Korea if North Korea invades in order to get America in a land war. And I was like, fine with that. Whatever God wants. Whatever God wants, I, I surrender. Wow. Tell me what to do, God. Wow. And I prayed two to three hours a day, I should add also. And they were not normal prayers. I came to realize this much, much later. They were prayers more like telling God things, you know, like uh, declaring things, as opposed to humbly asking for things or please guide me. I need to share another story that led to my promotion to the national headquarters. And this falls under the maybe category of spiritual experiences, but keep in mind, I was like sleep, sleep deprived. And so the mind does a lot of funny things. And I also did two seven day fasts and I think four, three day seven fasts, day fast. only water and worked full days. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But, um, I had this recurring dream where I was in a room. It was similar to the to the rooms that I would meet with Moon in the mansion, but I was brought to the head of the table where Moon was seated and the other leaders were around the table and Moon hands me a cleaver and says, I want you to chop off your finger. And in my dream, I put my pinky down and I chop off my finger and the blood spurting in my dream everywhere. And they give me a white gauze that instantly becomes red and moon is beaming. So happy and so proud of me. And I had this dream three nights in a row and I reported it to a Japanese uh, woman leader and and moon said i was tested in the spirit world and i passed and that's when i was told i was going to be the able to neil salone and the president of america mm. and what do you make of all that now again 
after the fact, trying to listen to other people who've left and piece things together, I was remembering that we had been told about the Yakuza, which are the Japanese mafia gangsters with tattoos, and they often have to chop off a finger to show loyalty to their gangster mob boss. So I think that may have been the origin of where I got that idea from. Mm. But it fit the model of Steve as the model American member that everyone needed to to follow. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a relevant thing. I want to tell one other. Well, really it, quickly, really quickly, okay. Steve, thank you. I'm going to just Go give a quick shout out. Uh, going bananas just gave a ten dollar super chat. If we, if if you guys don't mind, we have a lot of uh, live listeners right now. Please just take a moment to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. While you're at it, subscribe to Zelf on the Shelf. Uh, that's Samantha's YouTube channel as well. But those subscriptions really help. And I just want to thank Going Bananas for the super chat. Uh, they just made a ten dollar donation. You know, we we flew Steve out. We're paying for his stay along with the workshop that we're doing, but but we fronted the money and you know your donations help allow us to do things like have Samantha here as a co-host, have me here and have Steve come. So if any of you do wanna support us financially, whether it's through Super Chats on YouTube or through the donation button, uh, please do so. And while you're at it, support yourself on the shelf and their Patreon. Thank but you, um, thank you, Going Bananas. He writes, thank you, Steve, for making this episode happen. I'm in shock at how many parallels there have been so far. Mormon Stories has been so helpful in my faith crisis this past year. Thank you. And I don't think that, you know, Going Bananas is the only person who's mm. finding so much value in hearing your story to help them process their own. Did you want to add anything, Samantha? Um, no. Okay. But your story was also helpful to me when I was leaving Mormonism. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad. Yeah. Okay. So how did I get out of the cult? Well, yeah. after this without a Stephen Hassan with this near you. fatal van <laughs> crash and a very severely broken leg mm -hmm. and physical trauma to my body, I was in a hospital away from the cult sleeping all day long <laughs> and oh, eating and no contact with the group. My, my team came to visit me for a half an hour once and they were reassigned to somebody else and they gave me a little cassette recorder with one of moon's speeches on it but other than that there was no reinforcement for the cult mindset and um i did a kind of a violation of the instructions that i was under i called my sister thea who i was very close with growing up she's three years older than me and and she said i'm so happy to hear your voice and how are you and i'm like i'm in a hospital what happens and i fell asleep at the wheel of a van and i broke my leg and hurt myself oh my god I, you know i want to help you when can you come home and and i'm like i need surgery and i don't know if I can come and visit you because mom and dad are satanic. And my oldest sister, Steffi, also had said that I was in a cult and I was brainwashed. My sister, Thea, never did. So she was just like, I miss you and I don't understand. So she was the safest person for you. you absolutely. Thought you could absolutely. Mm -hmm. Huge lesson. Be safe yeah. if you want to have a relationship or even have influence on believing family and friends. Be she safe. was unconditionally loving, and that's mm. what the ethical side of the influence continuum is you love someone for their beingness, not because they're doing what you want them to mm -hmm. do or behaving or believing what you want them to believe. Can I ask a very quick question? Sure. Did, were the Moonies paying for your surgery and healthcare? I, I, the, the van was insured, and they got the cheapest, most pathetic. Um, medical help and they would routinely send people to clinics even though they had billions of dollars because mm. they didn't want to spend god's money mm. on members health care and if people got really sick they asked them to leave and become associate members and wouldn't take responsibility even though when they joined they turned over everything 
wow. to them financially. That's another egregious uh, uh, part of their policy. But my sister said, you have a nephew. I want him to know his Uncle Stevie. I'll never forget it because as a kid, I was called Stevie. <laughs> but that was like the real me, Stevie, right? And I said to her, I think I can arrange a visit, but you have to promise not to tell mom and dad or Steph that I'm, I would come. And I think I can arrange it. So and, you were taught that non-members were inferior and or evil. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> thousand percent. We were the we were the chosen, and not the way you were asking about Judaism, thinking that Jews are chosen people. The Moonies, we were the elite of God, period, in human history. And I mean, is that a soft parallel, Miss Samantha, or a hard parallel for Mormons? You think? The superiority. We don't it. think <laughs> non-Mormons are evil, right? Uh, I mean, anything ranging from just ignorant and under the influence of Satan without realizing it to full-blown evil. Or definitely spiritually inferior. Yeah. You would never say that as a Mormon. But no. you kind of um, and it even comes into other things, you know, non non Mormon marriages aren't forever. They're just, you know, second rate marriages, things but like that. But be aware of anyone who's not a believing faithful member and especially definitely. Of especially anyone who has any pushback on anything you believe or yeah. Stay away. Were you explicitly for forbidden for having contact with any of your family members? They told me to not tell them where I was because they had used the story that they were out to kidnap me and beat mm -hmm. me and torture me to lose my faith. Because you had mentioned that you called your dad um, about the Nixon thing. Was that allowed? Was there some Back amount of contact? That was much earlier in my involvement mm -hmm. and I didn't have a cell phone, but I was encouraged to proselytize. Got it. And the idea is to try to bring everyone in and get them to donate money. And to and there were a few parents who were willing to say that they support their loved one's choice of a new religious movement or group or something like that. Hmm. So my sister said she promised. I talked to my leader and I said, you know, once my surgery is over, I'm not going to be able to be fundraising or lecturing. I have I had a cast on from my toes to my groin at the time, and the other leg was bandaged, and my chest, I guess, had been compressed against the steering wheel. I said, I really feel guilty if if a family member needs to say and take care of me during my convalescence. I think I should go to my sister's house and let Satan take care of me. And he looked me in the eye and said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I think this is what God wants. And he said, okay. So then I got permission to go see my sister. I was on crutches. And thank God, my sister told my parents. <laughs> they did buy her ex-moonies. And, um, and uh, I was at my sister's house. I was on the living room couch, and the Moonies, and I was told by the Moonies to call in every three hours, and I didn't because I was visiting. So they were suspicious, and, and they kept saying, Oh, he's getting eyeglass, new eyeglasses because they had been smashed or were taking this or that. And finally, the Moonies are like, We're going, we're coming because they had known the address. And um, long story short was that I was, um, so fanatical. I had been prepped against deprogrammers. I was sure it would be a test that I could pass. Um, and I, of course I was angry that Satan had invaded uh, the situation, but it was a chance to prove my loyalty to father and true parents, etc. And um, but the Moonies were coming, so my and I had been asking for my mother because I my plan was to guilt trip my mom into releasing me because I could my mom would do whatever I told her, like historically, mom, please, I don't want to have to sue you and dad. <laughs> Whatever, that was my plan. So my father said, okay, let's go see mom. And I agreed to get into the back seat of a car. My leg was in, you know, outstretched and my dad was in the front and two of the ex-members, one of whom was someone I had recruited into the cult 
who uh, had left, Gladys, who was part of my team. I always liked Gladys. Anyway, um, so we're driving on the Long Island Expressway, and we pass the exit to my house, my parents' house. And my first thought was, we're not going home. I need to kill my father. And I started thinking about how I could reach over and snap his neck while he's driving on the expressway. And I actually thought about it several minutes. And then I thought, he's going to die. I'm going to die. The other people are going to die. And I still have so much more I can do on earth to, so, to help God. And they would never get me to betray father. So, like, this is ridiculous. So I decided not to kill my father in a moving car on the expressway. And we get to another location, and I'm in the back seat. My father's pulled over, and this football-sized man starts walking over to the car. 250, 300 pounds, you know, 6'5", or whatever. And I said to my father, my father was in the front seat of the car. He was turned around. And I said, I'm not getting out of the car. And if you make me, I will kill everybody. Or you will have to kill me. And the blood will be on your conscience forever. I'm looking at my father. <laughs> I'm saying these words. And my father starts to cry like a tear. <laughs> And he, this is the famous words he said. How would you feel if it was your son, your only son, who meets a group of people, a controversial group of people, drops out of college and disappears from your life? How would you feel? The tear got me. And I'm tearing up just remembering that moment because my authentic self was like, he really loves me. So I said, I was thinking. So communism, communists have brainwashed him to persecute father. I can step into his shoes and imagine why he's doing this. I could imagine doing the same if it was my son. So I said, I, I think I'd be doing what you're doing now. So what do you want from me? And he said, I just want you to sit and listen with an open mind to information. And if you want to go back in a few days, I'll drive you there myself. But at least your mother and I will be able to sleep at night knowing we did the responsible thing. I still get teary when I think about it. So again, for me, it was a challenge of my confidence that I wasn't in a cult and I wasn't brainwashed and I was doing God's will. I knew the truth. So I agreed. And so there was another three days that he asked me not to run away, not to try to contact the cult, but to listen and cooperate with the ex-members. And honestly, what was happening in the deprogramming, there were four deprogrammers. One was not an ex-Mooney. One was like a fanatical Christian who was very dogmatic. But the one that wasn't in, a, in the Moonies, all he did, his name was Gary Rosenberg, may he rest in peace. He would, he would say, so Steve, what do you think? And in retrospect, again, after the fact, I would be telling him how to get me out, but it was not conscious. How would you respond? So, you know, so Nestor and Mike, you know, would be talking about this or that, and I'd be, and then Gary would say, so what do you think? You know, like, Nestor's never going to get me with the Bible. I'm not a Christian. Like, that's not going to work. And this, da, da, da. I was like, the real me was like, here's here's the path to get me out um and gladys 
and this is another thing. Moonies and other cult members are really heavily phobitized about deprogrammers, that they were vicious, mean, satanic, like sex, drug, and rock and rollers. And I was a leader and I was trained how to discriminate and evaluate people. And I knew the, these were sincere, good hearted people. I didn't agree with them at the beginning because I was blocking every negative story they would share. But over time, as they were telling me stories, I started remembering better stories of more abuse or a better lie or whatever. I'll never forget Gladys, who I recruited. From when you were in. Yeah. When, but this when was an, a, an unconscious process, right? But Gladys was like, do you remember lying to me when you recruited me? And I was like, oh, I never lied to you. And then she like recounted the story that I said to her, which I had no memory of. And I truly, at that moment, if you put me on a stack of Bibles, I would have said, I never lied in the Moonies, like ever, because <laughs> I was so in that mindset. But the, the critical thing that opened me up was, was seeing the ex-members. No one was abusing me. Everyone was nice and gentle. They were very sure that the Moonies were a bad thing and that, that it was a cult, etc. I was doing thought stopping. My phobias were very strongly intact. But then I learned about Lifton and Chinese communist brainwashing because they said, you want to know about Chinese communist brainwashing? And in the Moonies, they were Satan. So sure, I'll learn about Chinese communist brainwashing. So we went through the eight criteria out of chapter 22 of thought reform and the psychology of totalism. Bye. Robert J. Lifton, yeah. MD, a psychiatrist. <clears throat> The subtitle is A Study of Brainwashing in China. I looked at the book, 1961, it was published. So I was like, oh, this is not an, an anti-father book or an anti-moon book. And we're going over the eight criteria, and it was clear to me that the Moonies did all eight of these excuse me, criteria. It did not compute because Satan... We were God, Chinese communists were Satan, but we're doing the same eight criteria that Lifton said was a brainwashing environment. So that was a major shift in my subconscious, did not fit like how God and Satan could be using brainwashing, the same patterns. And the thing that, that woke me up was the last day before I was gonna be driven back, to the to the cult was they handed me a speech printed by the cult where moon was speaking to congressmen and senators and i'm going to paraphrase but he said something like I, I i'm aware that you have heard of a controversy that i am brainwashing american youth i would never brainwash american youth i respect americans very much i'm surprised at such accusations and but again they were just asking me what do you think they weren't trying to tell me what to think and i'm reading this and i had the first negative thought in two and a half years i said what a liar mine what a snake was the first thought and then it was like wait a minute if he's a liar that means he can't be a man of God because we teach God is a God of truth it means that he's not trustworthy. And once I realized the whole thing was based on one presupposition that Moon was the Messiah, once Moon was not the perfect man anymore, I had this experience of, and I describe it like a house of cards going plop, 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 plop in my mind. And I also describe it like being in a dark room and someone opens the, the blinds and the sun comes in and you're like, holy crap. There's sun out there. There's green leaves on trees out there. And then I cried for three hours straight. I cried and cried. I had hurt. They had to bring me 
hold compresses because I couldn't stop crying. Hair is straight. Yeah. Remember, I had a cast on my leg, but I, w I was inconsolable. It's almost like a reverse spiritual epiphany, but like in horror as you realize what? What did you realize? I had do dedicated every fiber of my being to this group, and I realized it was a lie. In one moment, you had that realization. Yeah, it, it, it is later called a snapping moment, which it was what the programmers, there was a whole book called Snapping, where Ted Patrick, who created the term deprogramming, said you want to snap someone out of it by overloading them and forcing them to have this shift in consciousness, I've learned that this is horribly tra traumatizing <laughs> and I avoid doing anything that harsh and direct. But for me, I was so like, how did this happen to me? Like, I've been praying to you, God, and how could this, how could he be a liar? But how could we be doing brainwashing? All the things that I didn't believe we were a cult or we were brainwashed. Now I know that we were. I was a leader. I was horrified. And that moment was at the end of three days? It was five days from five start days. to finish. And nothing was, nothing felt like it was touching you up until that point? I was blocking it. Mm. But I was not. So I really subscribe to uh, the dual identity dissociative identity model because the real me was suppressed for those years it was i was hearing and remembering a lot of things that should have got me out if it was a normal environment but i was thought stopping phobia programming sleep deprivation all these things kept it in a box in my in myself and I was um, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, I was confused. I wanted I felt like I had been spiritually raped. I also described the feeling like I was on a skyscraper, like I was at the top of the world and I was just falling and I had no idea what would happen. I would crash and burn. I just fell out of control. Like I was falling off a skyscraper. Down, down, down. And um, it was really scary. Having former members, especially Gladys, who were loving and kind and spiritual, provided a, 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 an exit from the phobia indoctrination that, you know, I would be like the demon in the exorcist movie. Like that was not true. <laughs> I wasn't going to be possessed like that. But um, I, I was, it was, it was devastating. It was one of the most traumatic events of my life, aside from the crash how did your parents connect with those people those people meaning the people who they hired sorry yeah the deprogrammers so there was a fledgling movement led by a rabbi davis in new york um about the moonies because we were recruiting a lot of people on a lot of campuses and around there was a lot of effort of street witnessing we would do 72 hour witnessing uh events and street preaching i would stand on the street corners and be preaching to the air america we're in a crisis time god is summoning you you know and like crazy but anyway go ahead this is just a really random memory i remember when i was home in england at christmas last year there was uh what looked like a korean man standing in the middle of the town square i can't remember if he was singing or like preaching to the air but the, could that be connected there are so many korean cults okay and <laughs> many of them are former moonies who splintered off and started yeah. their own cults
is was there a term anti Mooney that Moonies would use to describe people who are opposing the church, or did you have a name or title that, that was disparaging for people opposing the church? Like like Scientology has what SPs subversive, subversive people, yeah, right? suppressive suppressive people. people. I was one, 1976. I'm proud to say because I spoke out against Scientology. Once I learned more about it, it horrified me. Um. No, no, people were just satanic or okay. communists. This was straight to Satan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. no communists. <laughs> satanic, atheists. Yeah. And and were you, did you have a, did you have a snapping moment, Samantha? I'm trying to remember. It was more a series of mini snaps, I'd say. And I could, I can remember sort of the final moment where the last shred of hope left my brain that this thing could still somehow be true and fit together and, you know. But um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that difference. It seems like some people can have that one single moment, but I feel like for a lot of ex-Mormons, it is a gradual process because those psychological mechanisms kick in, you double back down, you try and make it work for longer. I almost wonder, wonder if that's because Mormonism is slightly softer than the Moonies. So it almost allows you to go back. What do you think? No, I think my experience was very unique. You know, the combination of being away from the cult for two weeks mm. was huge. Which does make me think a lot of people left Mormonism in the pandemic. And they tell me that it's because just getting space from the yep. church helped them reevaluate. Yeah, so I did a TEDx talk, How Can I Know If I've Been Brainwashed? And I offered my story in the Moonies and then said there's a four-step reality testing strategy that anyone can answer that question for themselves. I don't know if you've seen it or know of this TEDx yes. talk, but basically I say the first step is separating yourself from the influencer or the predator or the predatory organization. And I do believe that you can have a one-on-one -on -one mind control situation with a malignant narcissist. Just get away and sleep and eat and be in nature and remember who you were before you ever met this group. And I know it's different when people have been raised and born or raised in a group. But for those of us who are recruited later in life, just take a time out. Next, study models of brainwashing, thought reform, and mind control. I use Lifton because it was so p pivotal to me. And by the way, I've interviewed him. He's still alive. He's in his 90s. Oh, wow. If people want to see my interviews with him, you can come to my YouTube channel. Um, so study Lifton. Singer was another person who had a model or my bite model of authoritarian control. Study that. Then the next step is deliberately seek out ex-members and critics. Because when you're in a mind control cult, you're programmed never to trust an ex-member or a critic. They, it's spiritual pornography or it's garbage or dog eating its vomit or whatever. But if you take the position of, I want to know what's true, I want to know what's real, and I'm smart, and I can discern, find out what's the beef, especially former leaders of a group or someone who is sixth generation like find out their story and really listen to it. And then with the knowledge of the bite model, with the knowledge of former members, go back in your experience and ask yourself if I knew then what I know now, like when I was on the mission or this or that, then you can begin to reality test. Yes, it either fits the authoritarian bite model of control thing or it or it doesn't or it's somewhere in between but that that by doing that exercise at least you can know hmm here's here's the here are the models but that by experts here's what the critical information says the truth the facts that are documented the former leaders and then being honest with yourself. That's the other thing I want to say is people need to be honest. And as a therapist, if people really want to make change or grow, they need to be really honest with themselves, even if they have impermissible thoughts or feelings. It's like, let them out. Let's air it out. Let's look at it all and um, have that kind of commitment to you know, reality. 
And it's, so that's how to know whether you've been brainwashed. It's so tough because we always talk about um, th the question that is so important that members, Mormons are able to ask themselves if, is if this wasn't true, would I want to know? And I feel like for members to even get to the point where they see the value of those four steps or see the value of asking whether this is, there almost needs to be a weakening of faith prior to even getting to that point. So it's so hard to... So I remember before ask. the moon, I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no, you didn't. So I remember before the moonies, I read, uh, I want to say it was a Zen teaching story. Uh, I'm not remembering the author, but the story was that um, a man grew up in a village. He went on a hunting trip or he left the town and something happened in the well water. And everyone went crazy. Everyone went mad. And the man came back and realized they all drank the water and they're all nuts. And, and the purpose of the story is to ask yourself, would you drink the water to fit in? Or would you mm. say, nope, they're mad. I don't want to, I this is my life and I don't want to be mad. And I remember that story because in my mind I said, no, I would not drink the water. Of course, people talk about the flavor aid uh, all the time with Jonestown, like, and they try to make jokes about it, which isn't funny for people like me to hear jokes about it. But this story about if you knew that something wasn't true, would you? choose to believe it just to fit in or not and again we'll talk more i guess tomorrow but uh, i like to teach people social psychology and how the mind works and explain our biases of consciousness and to build a framework because i believe if you talk to mormons and ask what do you think of the chinese communist brainwashing programs right now that they'll say it's terrible and that it's immoral and illegal but they won't know anything about what's happening there but that's the bridge you you find something that they would say is wrong and evil and bad and you ex then you break it down and explain the 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 variables and then you're creating a platform for analysis of your own experience. And I think that's, I think I want to make sure, and there are a couple more questions I want to ask before we tie up. Okay. But I'm going to make another plug for your course because Please. you have a foundations of cult space. It's a foundational course. course. I aimed it for clinicians initially, but people have been taking it who are ex-members or relatives who have a loved one in a cult that they're trying to help. And uh, it's just the foundational knowledge. Uh, there's much more to describe about how to actually talk to people in a, uh, an effective way, but it's an, over nine hours. And I think it's very uh, a very good value for people because it's basically the equivalent of one hour of my time of talking, doing a consult to take the course. It's almost 10 hours. Yeah. And I just included a link to it in the comments mm -hmm. and we'll include it in the show notes. Cool. But I mean, come on, this guy's a legend. He's mm -hmm. now spent almost 50 years of his life helping build cult awareness and helping people extricate themselves from un unhealthy organizations and cults and not just churches and religions, mm -hmm. but MLMs and you know gurus political and, cults therapy cults um large group awareness training cults yeah um and controlling relationships and not to mention russia china iran and other authoritarian dictatorships and i took a look at with him of the of the course and kind of the breakdown and it's amazing so mm -hmm. please buy the course for your own well, awareness check it out. and knowledge but also support Steve and his work because you need support to carry on the further work that you want to do. Yeah, I'm right? trying to scale, John, my work because there's only one of me and I'm not getting younger. So I want to train up those who want to learn, who are coaches, who want to be therapists, et cetera, as well as just I want to empower all former members to do the self-healing work so that they can share their story 
and destigmatize to the general public that only stupid people can be in a cult or you know ignorant people that, that there are brilliant people who've been had their minds hacked and have gotten into these situations whether they were born in or recruited in. yeah yeah so uh please support Stephen Hassan and his work um and by the course so really quickly now back to Samantha's question yes you you have this this whiplash what was the moment you called it a what moment snapping snapping moment you had the snapping moment you had this devastating three-hour cry because of this intervention you realized that you had given your life and everything to a cult what are what were those final steps to leave and were you terrified uh to leave especially since you had ascended at such a high level what were those final steps oh i thought they were going to murder me i thought i'd be assassinated as soon as they knew that i was no longer in because i i was at these meetings where you know they trusted my loyalty and i wound up giving all these speeches to the u.s government and outing them but like I said, I was saying before, I just made a very conscious decision. I sat down in front of um, the cameras in the first few weeks and told everything I could remember. I later remembered a lot more, but I, I put them in lawyers' safes and said, if, I'm, if I die, if I'm killed, this should be released. These are VHS have, tapes? This was before Beta, Beta VHS. Max? This I may have been eight millimeter or something. Do these, do this these was seventy six. I have exist? no idea. Oh, would that be cool if they still yeah, exist? But but I YouTube but I, I put them in. I had two copies, and I had lawyers say, if anything happens to Steve Hassan, we have all of his recordings, and they will be released publicly, and there will be such bad public relations, you will never recover from it. The other thing I did was I really tried to align myself with high profile people, um, politicians, people in the Jewish um, uh, world um, came to my defense. But I, I pretty much um, said, you know me, and I'm telling you, if you try to stop me, I will work harder to expose you. And I've used that. And, and I really feel like I've been gifted my life. Like I never imagined I'd be 47 years doing this work. I've, I'm a cancer survivor from like, was it 16 years ago? I had lymphoma. And that's another discussion about how important good sleep is. Seven to nine hours. John DeLynn, sleep seven to nine hours. Well, you wink, wink, out, nod, so nod. You just seem like someone that might be underslept. <laughs> <laughs> no, but people who are raised in cults where they don't sleep <clears throat> properly, that's one of the most important things for their their health and recovery is is like become, realizing we are in our bodies and we have to take care of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's a very wise thing. And a, a toxic thing with a lot of cults is believing that your body's evil and that you should ignore the pain that, you know, that you're suffering versus go to a doctor and find out you may have cancer and you need surgery or radiation or mm -hmm. chemo or something that happened with me with the golf ball in my armpit. Anyway, um, so, but I, I, I feel very at peace. I, I make my, my decisions, you know, based on I want to do something valuable every day to contribute to help more people. Yes, you want to I was just going to say, it's one thing, most people, I don't know, at least in many of the high demand religions I'm aware of, they never leave. So it's a monumental act to figure it out. And a lot, by the way, there's a lot of people these days in 2023 in Mormonism who figure it out, but don't have the courage to leave. So there's figuring it out. That's monumental having whatever resilience and strength and courage to just figure it out and openness. Then there's deciding to leave. That's a whole nother major milestone. But there's so many people that would leave and just like disappear and just say like, I'm running as far away from this as possible. So not only figuring it out and leaving, but then deciding not only to speak up and be an activist, that's a third major step that you took. But then the fourth is dedicating your entire life 
to helping others. What the heck were you thinking? Like, yes, yeah, so what there's led a to the story. What is it about you that had you take all four of those steps versus <laughs> other people that would stop far sooner? Samantha? It's like that Spider Man meme where the two Spider Men are looking <laughs> back at each other. <laughs> I have, I've only got 20. So, <laughs> by the way, Spider Man was in Queens, by the way, which is <laughs> my borough. Yeah. So, I have all the superheroes. <laughs> I, I've always liked Spider Man a lot. So, uh, there's another piece to the story that I think your listeners want, may want to hear to answer your question, and that is. So at the point that I cried and I said, I don't want you to drive me back. I said, I'm, my brain is fried and I don't want to make any commitments or decisions for the next three months. I need to figure this out because I felt totally overloaded and really confused. I said to my father, you need to go get my stuff. Out of this location, I have all these internal documents that are really important. I signed a notarized document. He went with the police to the location of the Mooney house. They tried to stall and go through my stuff, but we got all the main speeches out. So I was already thinking ahead. Um but the 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 big thing that shifted for me is um I just started reading again and I had been reading two to three books a week before the Moonies and I read nothing in the Moonies other than Mooney material and stuff. So my concentration was shot. My, even my recollection of what words meant, I had to read a dictionary again to remind myself what words meant. And I developed, and I was told by a therapist, Steve, the mind's like a muscle. Like if you broke your arm and you had it in a cast, when the cast comes off, you're weak. You're going to need to do exercise. You need to just have that attitude to reclaim your power, your psychological power. That was really helpful. But I said, I, I really need to talk to Lifton. <laughs> so... I asked around, I found out he was at Yale, and I got his phone number, and I called his office, and I talked to Lily Finn, his secretary, and I said, I'd like to arrange a talk with Dr. Lifton. What's this about? I read his book, and it saved my life. Huh? Which book? Huh? Anyway, he gets on, on. No, actually, it was he got on the phone with me and he, he, I said, your book saved my life. He said, which book? Because he had written a bunch of them by that. I said, thought reform, the psychology of total. Love. He said, that old book? <laughs> Why? And I said, well, I was recruited into the Moonies at Queens College in 1974, and I became this stranger. I became this, you know, radical person, and da 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 da. da. And I really want to talk to you about it. So I had read his book, and it didn't match my experience. Because so he said, come and see me, and he arranged to have me come to his penthouse it wasn't penthouse it was the central park west apartment um overlooking central park nice than queens and i'll never forget <laughs> this meeting because here's this yale psychiatrist i'm a college dropout right i'm like a nobody embarrassed ashamed and i'm i'm sitting on the couch my legs up with my cast <laughs> and he's standing there and there's a wall of hardcover books from the top to the floor, the entire room. And I start to explain how I was recruited, how I recruited people, the three-day work, the introductory lectures, the three-day workshop, seven-day, a 21-day, 40-day workshop. And he's listening and he's nodding. And then he says the fateful words. He says, you know, I just studied this second hand, but you lived it. They did it to you and you did it to other people. And what you're describing is so much more sophisticated than what I studied. You need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. Wow. So he was turning over the mantle to you a little bit. 
it, it's called in the biz a therapeutic reframe or turning lemons into lemonade. <laughs> but it was like, there's some value to this, what I went through. So, and then I started meeting ex-members of Scientology and other groups. I'm like, holy Are, are you feeling emotional right now? Yes. Oh, I'm just, tearing up. Oh. We'll so, so what is it you're feeling? When, like, yeah, no, I believe you. I'm just. No, I was back in the room with him. So that brings up the feelings. Of what? Of um, how lost I was and how confused. <laughs> and how much we can have such an impact in a short amount of time to just change somebody's life completely. But even so, I never imagined I'd be doing this for 47 years. I thought, oh, I did two and a half years. I'll do two and a half years to take them down, was what I was thinking. Then Jonestown happened. When I saw the bodies and the children, I was like, I couldn't have done that. So that what that's what propels me to this day. Because you never know. Like I'm doing this talk that could be somebody in another country hearing this story and might ignite them. Life is precious. Our time on earth is precious and we can lift each other up. I think we got to end there. What do you think, Samantha? <laughs> yeah. That's super powerful and super beautiful. And I, I, I really, and I'm, I, I thank my deprogrammers. I have a blog, you know, with pictures on my 40th anniversary of my deprogramming. I'm ever grateful. One became a psychiatrist, one became a social worker. Um, I'm forever grateful because back then you were you were risking getting arrested and going to jail. It was a big deal to rescue somebody. Mm. The comments from the live streamer flowing in, things like, thank you so much, Stephen. Oh, my heart. You know, love you, Steve. So, are the Mormon stories? The Mormon stories audience is sending you their love and gratitude. Thanks, and thanks to my family who loved me always. They didn't give up on me. Love is stronger than mind control. I keep telling the people that. Don't give up. Even if the cult members won't talk to you, you keep talking to them and just say, I miss you, I love you. I had a dream about you, that we were together doing a picnic or fishing together again or whatever. Bring up good memories. Let them know that you love them no matter what. Even if they are in a cult, you still love them. You love their heart. They love their beingness. I think about that a lot with um, cult like political ideologies these days and how I think my generation and the one below it can be quite quick to cut off their loved ones for believing the wrong things and um, you know obviously if there's not a healthy way for someone to be in your life I understand that and boundaries are important but I just think like keeping whatever bridges you can even if those bridges are like the favorite movie that you and your mom and dad share, like they matter and they, they might, you know, lead to somewhere further one day. So I'm always an advocate for people not burning them, even if they they seem tiny and, you know. And there are therapists you can have as mediators mm. if there are violations from your childhood where you are unsafe or not protected. There are people who you can ask and say, would you be willing to contact people? And on the flip side, I've had former members come to me whose families have turned their back on them because they were so 
angry and hurt that they didn't come to their wedding or they didn't go to see mom when she was dying of cancer to say goodbye. And they're so angry at the cult member and they don't put the anger at the cult. They blame the person and they don't understand they were on mind control. Yeah. Well, that was beautiful and that was powerful. And I think that makes it a good way to end today's episode. But number one, you've been so generous to give us so much time today, you know, um, but tomorrow we still have more time. And we have Thrive on Saturday. If for those who Yeah, wanna... I'm excited to learn more and meet more people. If anyone has my books and wants me to sign them at any of these in person things, I'd be happy to make time to to uh, sign or take a selfie or whatever. So if you are joining us now live and you are um interested in tonight, the Lost and Found Club, uh led by Chelsea Homer and her wonderful board, they're having Steve speak. Uh, you can go to lostandfound.club. There's a link in the description right now. You, there's still tickets available. You can see Steve tonight with Chelsea Homer's Lost and Found Club. Also, please check out uh, Faith Journey Meetups, which is a Facebook group that Chelsea Homer started that has almost 10,000 progressive and post-Mormons supporting each other, women supporting each other throughout the world. Check that out. And then Thrive, you're speaking at Thrive uh, Unite in Lehigh and in Ogden on Saturday. Uh, coming up, go to thrivebeyondreligion.com or go to the description to get links to that. And then Sunday, you and I are doing a full-day workshop. That's the thing I'm most excited <laughs> about, honestly, because we haven't taught together, and I really want to learn from you, and I really want to teach what I'm learning as I'm interacting with ex-Mormons. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, well, I feel a little bit like you felt when Lifton said you need to teach others. So I'm like, what? <laughs> Trust me, you, you, you ha have been teaching me. Um, yeah, so if you want to join us on Sunday, we'd love to have you. It's going to be an Alpine. Again, in the description is the links to the all-day workshop, and there's still tickets available for that as well. Um, and if we can, we're going to record that and then yeah. make it available. Yeah, the the we we want to empower more people to do their full healing, and to know what they can do to help family and friends who are still trapped. Yeah. And finally, I'll just end by saying, buy Steve's books. Uh, the two books that we're plugging explicitly are combating cult mind control. Please buy this book and buy twenty copies for your friends and family right now buy this book and the other book is freedom of mind if you're having thoughts about helping loved ones leave controlling uh people cults and beliefs freedom of mind is a book that uh, you can purchase i also mentioned that you wrote a book that you believe very passionately about called the cult of trump and while uh we try and stay as politically neutral as we can on mormon stories podcasts so they don't get off mission and alienate people i, I have to show you the respect of mentioning the book and saying that if you want to learn about Stephen's analysis um, as it relates to to Trump, you know that's up to you. Yeah, but and I'd like to invite people to come to freedomofmind.com because I have uh, downloadable PDFs of the Influence Continuum, the Bite Model, List of Malignant Narcissism, my work on trafficking, sex and labor trafficking. Check out my blog interviews. I do a range of interviews and um you know we have uh i have videos of my interviews with lifton as well as talking about his other books the nazi doctors he his last book is called losing reality and i forget the subtitle but it has to do with cultism because he's come in a journey he was very afraid to speak out about cults when i was speaking out about cults and he's he's morphed also mm, fantastic so the, there's a youtube channel and please again uh, buy buy Stephen's course and support him and learn a lot through that. All right, and tomorrow we're going to come right back and we're going to talk about healing and growing after a cult or a high demand religion and how to communicate with believing family and friends that are still in. We're just going to scratch the surface and we'll get six six good hours with you at least. So, on behalf of my listeners and viewers. Stephen Hassan, uh, you're an inspiration to us all. Thank you so much. We Sean. give you our, our respect and our honor and our gratitude for your life's work. 
Thank you. I want to uh, forgive me because I know we're wrapping up, but the first time you contacted me and asked me to be on Mormon Stories, I was like, hmm, do I want to be on Mormon Stories podcast? And I said, you know, would you read Combating? And I'll never forget you emailed me, your book's <laughs> blowing my mind. And then the next day I get a color coded bite model <laughs> analysis no one ever did a color coded i was like brilliant idea can i use that with other groups and you're like sure <laughs> you know uh, always never sometimes color coding thing and it's like brilliant thank you john so you contributed to my work uh, dramatically well it's fun yeah and I'll, I'll i'll try and find a link to that post because i made a post i basically took all the sub bullets for b i t and e and rated mormonism green yellow or red for whether they they qualified for the criteria yeah and, and i uh, <laughs> i dare say we could probably do a version for women in these patriarchal cults too i did an interview with yasmin mohammed who was raised in a extremist muslim cult married to a al-qaeda terrorist and uh she opened my eyes to the oppression of women uh uh, under fundamentalist Islam, which is horrendous you know, in Afghanistan and Iran. Women need more empowerment and support, as do gay people and indigenous people. Yeah. Yep. And trans people. And, yes. You know, and yeah, I, I love that your work spans not just churches and religions, but yoga instructors and MLMs and yeah. governments and you know educational institutions and podcasters mm. it can be applied to your significant other right and your yes. parents right it's all that so yeah it's great stuff samantha i am so glad I, I contacted you like 30 minutes before we started and said can you get here i know I'm i woke up so late today but i was like Stephen hassan yeah i'll be there <laughs> yeah thank I'm you glad you here, did samantha. too Thanks. yeah this has been amazing and, and me six years ago is I'm going so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, check out Samantha. Samantha is a coach. Samantha Shelley Coaching. Is that yes, the that's my website. With and Zelf on the Shelf is my YouTube channel. And subscribe to Mormon Stories and subscribe to Zelf. Subscribe on Patreon to Zelf. And uh, support us on Mormon Stories if you feel like it. But most importantly, today, support Stephen Hassan. No, I think support <laughs> everybody who <laughs> deserves it. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Stephen. We'll see you tomorrow. See you later. We'll see you, Samantha. Yes. And we'll see all you again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Contact. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. And remember that love is stronger than mind control. Did yes. I get that right, Stephen? Absolutely. Love yes, is it stronger is. than mind control. Yeah. That was beautiful. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. And uh, thanks, Steve. We'll see you all again very soon.